Got our kids done the first one and then we're gonna put them in for January. You're good. I hereby call this public meeting to order. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land of which we gather on is a traditional territory of the Anunnabish, the Wauke, the Ottawa, and the Mississaugas people. Confirmation of the agenda that the Council of Township of North Huron uh, hereby accept the agenda for December 20, 2021 Council meeting. And there is a. Yeah, so uh, I'm looking for an amendment to that. So basically, the motion would be that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby accept the agenda for the December 20th, 2021 Council meeting as amended to include the written comments submitted from Chastine Utley as agenda item 6.2.3.9. And those those items are in front of council thank you do I have a mover Paul moves uh, Kevin seconds in favor <laughs> um, disclosure of pecuniary interest I will start I will not be part of the 6.2 uh, conversation someone else from the council will take over as I have family members that are involved in this uh, issue Trevor? Yes, thank you, Eve. Um, I also, as Deputy Reeve, I will also be declaring a uh, conflict of interest on 6.2. So I'm declaring a conflict of interest due to my indirect conflict with the potential purchaser of the property, which this rezoning is a condition of. And this indirect conflict is a result of my employment. So I will not, well, I will now not be speaking on this motion or having any discussion as it relates to this topic. Thank you very kindly. Number four is public comments, an opportunity for every, any member of the public to speak on any item of business uh, that's on the council meeting. And um, I would they have two minutes. You can step forward, give us your name and address and speak. Having said that, 6.2, when we get to 6.2, the rezoning of the trailer uh, land, there will be opportunity then for anybody in the public to speak as part of the open council. So there's two times to speak about it, if you like, or speak about anything else in, on the uh, agenda, and that is right now. You have two minutes apiece. Or you, uh, for the folks that are here for the trailer park rezoning, uh, you will have time to speak to it when the county uh, officer is uh, conducting that meeting. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, so any comments related to that public meeting uh, need to wait until that public meeting. Uh, anything outside of the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, um, you're free to come up to the microphone now and provide your um, your your name and your comments. Not seeing anybody. Do you have one? Oh, yep. Sorry. Hey, <laughs> Reeve. <coughs> yep. My name is Tim Poole. I'm a resident of Wingham. I uh, noticed on the agenda that it's a farewell to uh, Donna uh, for all her years of service. I would like to thank Donna personally for uh, her dedication to the township and for coaching me along when I was chief of police uh, in doing budgets. Thank you very much, Donna. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Not, yes, go ahead. If you want to just come up and just give us your name at the. Uh... May I just have a point of clarification? Yep. Yeah. You can actually, I believe, have more than two minutes then. So that's cr uh, yep. correct. You would speak at, it at that time, um, and it's, I guess, at the discretion of the chair in regards to length. Okay. okay so no need to do it yeah. now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, consent. Uh, and is there anyone else? Not seeing anyone again. Um, Consent agenda, consent uh, agenda that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby adopts consent agenda items 5.1.1 to 5.1.2. And further, the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby receives consent items 5.1.3 to 5.3.4 for information. Before I ask for movers, would anybody like to pull anything from that agenda? Not seeing any, can I have a mover and a seconder, please? I have uh, Paul Heffer moving. I have Rick McBurney seconding. All in favor? Carries. Um, 
public meetings, hearings, and delegations in six. 6.1, retirement presentation to Donna White, Director of Finance. Donna, do you mind coming up? One last time. Donna, on behalf of the Township of North Huron, we want to thank you very kindly for your many, many, many years of loyalty and service. You and I both know that you made it look so easy, but it was so hard sometimes. So I just want to thank you very kindly, and I want to give this uh, token of appreciation thank to you. you. So much. And we have a girl here that would like to take a picture. All right. Okay, and we'll try to keep our, our distance a bit, All too. All right. Yeah. All right. That's great. I am smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure working at North Huron with uh, all the members of council, staff. We have such a dedicated, hard-working bunch here, and uh, I think the great things are on the horizon for North Huron. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Now we're going to uh, go to 6.2, and at this point in time, uh, both myself and Deputy Reef Sipes will be leaving the meeting, and Carson will be calling for someone from the uh, rest of council to conduct the meeting. Thank you, Your Worship. So in light of the conflicts of interest declared by Reef Bailey and Deputy Reef Sipes, I'm looking for a member of council to step forward uh, to chair um, the public meeting for the uh, official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment. Oh. Put a motion forward. To I'll put an application forward. As yourself, to Chair? Yes. So um, the motion right now is that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby appoints Councillor Falconer to Chair uh, Agenda Item 6.2. So you have uh, Councillor Falconer as the mover and a seconder? I would. Say, do I vote on that too then? Or? Yeah, you can. It's okay. in advance of that. Okay. All in favor? Carries. I can do it from here if that's okay with you. It doesn't matter. Well, I'm going to ask the chair, you may want to be up here because you have the gavel up here, and I'll go over here. I'm not going to throw it at anybody. So I don't know. Uh, no, I'm going to be hiding over here. You can't. Okay, item 6.2, the joint uh, public meeting of the official plan amendment, uh, OPA 15, and the zoning bylaw amendment, Z07-21. Uh, location lot 367 to 370, registered plan 410 Wingham Ward, uh, Township of North Huron, 166 John Street West. Uh, applicant owner, BM Ross and Associates Limited, uh, care of Kelly Vader, Township of North Huron. 6.21, a presentation from the Huron County Planner. So I'll ask the, uh, Hannah, is Hannah here? Yep. We'll need someone else to get the lights since you're. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Hannah. Everyone hear me okay? Uh, you can maybe just turn the mic to your port. Yeah, you can move that mic a little hand. Mic right in front of the uh, turn so everybody can hear. Okay, is that better? Yes. Yep. Once again, um, uh, thank you for having me uh, here tonight, uh, Council. Um, so as was described, the following um, is my presentation for the public meeting for official plan amendment OPA 15 and zoning bylaw amendment Z0721. Um, just uh, to describe the subject land, so municipally the lands are known as 166 John Street West in Wingham, um, identified here on this uh, location map. 
Um, the subject property was uh, previously used as a seasonal campground operated by the township, uh, locally referred to as the Wingham Trailer Park. Uh, the following shows um, a 2020 aerial imagery of the subject property and the surrounding lands. The subject property is currently vacant. Um, surrounding land uses to summarize include uh, to the north uh, there is uh, parkland uh, as well as a portion of the Wingham Community Trail. Uh, there is a community co uh, facility in the form of the Township Children's Center, uh, single detached dwellings as well as further north apartment buildings. Um, to the west of the property is a portion of the Maitland River, um, single detached dwellings as well as there is a Union Gas Utility lands. Um, to the east is the Royal Canadian Legion, um, other single detached dwellings, uh, as well as to the south across um, from Victoria Street West is another portion of the Maitland River. Um, the following just shows um, site photos of the subject property. Um, so looking um, south from the northern portion of the property in this first photo on the top here, um, and then just looking north of the subject property and the surrounding lands um, from the south to the north on the second photo there. Um, in terms of the proposed uh, development proposed by the applicants, just to provide some more details, the following shows um, a conceptual site plan as provided by the applicant. Um, Council should note that this does reflect the applicant's proposal as submitted and is subject to change. Um, however, to summarize the proposal, it is for a 73-unit apartment building. Um, the size of the actual apartment building um, is just under 1,800 square meters, uh, which is just over 19,000 square feet in size. The height of the structure is um, five stories. The building is located, however, on a mixed grade, uh, which does provide for the appearance of four stories from the eastern view um, and five stories from the western view. The maximum height of the building um, is 18.7 meters or 61 feet. Uh, there are 90 parking spaces in total proposed. 73 to correspond uh, with each unit and 17 extra spaces, which provides for a parking ratio of approximately 1.23 spaces per unit. The northwest portion of the site is proposed to remain as a landscaped open space, um, as well as shown here on the plan um, in this area here in the northwest. Um, that is proposed uh, to be the location of the redirected uh, Wingham Community Trail, um, so that is also being considered. Uh, as part of the site plan. There is amenity space located on the site um, for the tenants, which is just uh, delineated here in the picnic area. Um, there also is a proposal to have on-site snow storage, uh, which not shown on this concept plan, but in more detailed drawings, it is approximately located um, here, just on the north portion of the site. The proposal will also include site buffering on the surrounding properties. So this is a requirement um, of the North Huron zoning bylaw. Um, so that is something that will also form part of the development. Um, so just to move along, um, the following shows uh, exterior elevations that were provided by the applicant uh, to show a concept plan of the proposed development. Um, so as shown here, if you, if you look at the south elevation, um, it does provide a little bit of a visual in terms of that mixed grade that I was talking about previously. Um, so from the eastern view, it does appear that there are four stories and due to the mixed grade um, on the, the rear of the property towards the west, um, it would appear that there would be uh, five stories just because of that mix and grade. Um, the following is another um, conceptual view of the exterior elevation from another view. So this is just showing the, the front portion of the building and the main entrance from uh, the eastern view. Um, and similarly, here is another uh, view of the front of the property. Um, and again, you can see in the corner there um, what it would look like with the mixed grade for that ground floor. So just to provide some more details before I go into um, more details about the specific amendments, just in terms of the planning process and where we're at. So the first step in the planning process, th that's where we are right now in that the applicants are seeking an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, so typically these are standard planning applications that we do receive as part of development proposals um, and they would be the first things that would be considered in, in the process and I'll go into more detail about what that means later in my presentation. Um, secondly, um, the applications, so let's say in theory they, they move through the official plan amendment zoning by law amendment phase. Um, they will go through what is called site plan control. So this is a requirement of the current North Huron site plan control bylaw. Um, and at that point, a lot of the specifics about the site, so things like 
um, site lighting, landscaping plans, lot gradage and draining, um, stormwater management, um, servicing. Those would all be dealt with in further uh, engineered detail at that time at site plan control. Um, and that would be formalized with a site plan agreement registered on title. Once they move through that process, the next step um, is the permitting phase. Um, so uh, that would include um, seeking a building permit from the township, um, as well as in this case from the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority. Uh, they would also require permit um, just because of the location of these subject lands. Um, so that's just an over, a brief overview of the process just to see where we're at. So um, right now we're just uh, considering these two amendments. Um, so just to provide some more detail specifically about the official plan amendment. So the, the amendment is um, seeking a designation change. So this, this is sometimes referred to as a mapping change. The, the property is currently designated parks and open space. Uh, this reflects the previous use of the lands uh, as the recreational trailer park um, and the proposals to change these lands um, to residential. So in this image here, you can see an excerpt from the, the draft bylaw for this that um, shows that the property will is proposed to be changed from parks and open space to residential. In terms of more specifically the zoning bylaw amendment, typically these are a little bit uh, provide a little bit more detail. Um, so this is an amendment to the North Huron Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Uh, there is two purposes to this. The, the first one being um, to change the actual zone of the land. So that would be a, equivalent to a mapping change. Uh, the lands are currently zoned urban, natural environment and open space. Um, and there is a special zone. So the, the special zone uh, reflects the previous use of the property to permit uh, the special use uh, as a recreational trailer park. Uh, the proposed rezoning um, is to rezone the lands to residential high density, uh, which does permit residential uses such as an apartment building. Um, and there would also be a special zone proposed. Uh, the intent of the special zone uh, would be that it would specify um, specific provisions that would be uh, site specific to that property. So I'll go into further detail about that in the next slide, but um, this is just an excerpt from the draft bylaw showing um, the mapping change there. So in terms of what the, what more specifically the zoning bylaw amendment is seeking. Um, so these are provisions um, that they are seeking from. So in the North Huron zoning bylaw, there are um, a series of general provisions as well as uh, provisions that are general to the R3 residential high density zone. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon for development to require um, occasionally relief from these requirements on a site specific basis. Um, so th that's specifically what they're uh, requesting in this case. Um, so more specifically, um, so I'll just provide some more detail on the three uh, special provisions that uh, the applicant is proposing. Um, the first one would be to increase the maximum height uh, to five stories from three stories. I'll just provide a bit more detail on this. Um, so again, as I said before, the building is located on a, a mixed grade. Um, so the building height does range because typically building height is measured from grade. Um, so that's important to remember that context. The maximum height again uh, is 18.7 meters or 61 feet for five stories. And again, uh, as well, just to the just due to the mixed grade, again, when you see those uh, exterior elevations um, from the eastern view, it does give the appearance that it is uh, four stories from the eastern view. Uh, but as per the definitions in the zoning bylaw, it is considered five stories. Um, they are also seeking uh, to decrease the required parking spaces. So as previously mentioned, the, the development includes 73 residential units. Uh, and as, as per the proposed amendment, they are proposing one space per dwelling unit, which would provide for a minimum of 73 spaces. Uh, however, it's worth noting that the proposed development does include um, extra parking spaces as, as well for a total of 90 parking spaces. And again, just to say this does provide for a parking ratio of 1.23 spaces uh, per unit. Um, so the last provision, um, so there is a general provision currently right now in the, in the North Huron zoning bylaw um, that directs that structures be located a minimum of 30 meters away from the top of bank of a water course if the water course is over 7.5 meters in size, uh, which the Maitland uh, River is. Um, so th they are seeking relief of this um, to have a proposed setback of 24 meters. Um, it's worth noting in this case that um, 
Typically with these types of requests, we do rely on the technical expertise of the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority. Um, and the buffering uh, for this would be formalized uh, in the site plan control process. Uh, but right now that setback currently is set at um, 24 meters. So just to continue along, so um, as part of their application, um, the proponents did provide um, a series of supporting studies to support the development. So I will just briefly go over uh, the purpose of these studies and their, their key findings. So uh, the applicants did complete phase one and phase two of an archeology span assessment. Uh, the study concluded that the lands were free of any archeological resources and um, this assessment has been acknowledged uh, by the provincial ministry um, and entered into their records. So, um, the site is considered to be free of archaeological resources. Um, secondly, they did do an environmental site assessment um, for an acronym. This is sometimes referred to as the ESA uh, was completed. Uh, uh, so there are multiple uh, phases that you complete as part of this study. Um, so phase one did indicate that there was potential previous activities on the property that uh, might provide contaminants. Um, so uh, they did complete a phase two ESA, which uh, included um, field work on the site, um, looking at the soils and groundwater quality of the site. Um, and it was identified that there was a portion of the property that was contaminated. Uh, and as such, the applicants did um, engage in a phase three ESA, um, which was uh, the purpose of that was to, to complete the work to remediate the site. Um, so the site has been remediated um, and the conclusion of the, that study is that the subject site is suitable for residential use in, in this specific context. Uh, they also completed an environmental impact study. Um, so this primary looked at the impact of the development on the terrestrial and aquatic natural environment features on the property, um, including any wildlife on the property. Um, this was um, conducted by um, a consultant and it was uh, peer reviewed uh, by the Huron County biologist. Um, the results of this indicated that the development will not result in negative impacts on the natural features, provided um, a series of recommendations in the report are followed. Um, so things like any, any tree removal would occur during certain periods of the year um, to minimize impact. Um, a landscaping plan would be implemented with native species, um, and as well as some recommendations regarding stormwater management and lot gradage and drain. Um, so the implementation of these recommendations will be formalized at the time of site plan control. Um, next, a functional servicing brief was completed. Um, so this primary looked at the servicing fe feasibility of the lands in terms of uh, public water and as well as public wastewater. The findings concluded that there is sufficient capacity to support the proposed development uh, with detailed uh, engineering regarding this to occur um, at time of site plan control. Uh, and lastly, the proponents did complete an urban design brief um, that described the design of the um, exterior of the building and the site layout. Um, in a further planning report um, for myself, the results of these studies and their policy connections will be uh, discussed further, but that was a, a, another study that they did complete. Um, in terms of agency comments, so the, these applications are circulated to agencies, including township staff, as well as external agencies, um, as prescribed under the Planning Act. Um, so just to summarize the comments, the, the township chief building official indicated that they had no concerns with the proposal. Uh, the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority stated that they have no concerns with the proposed amendments at this time, uh, and that it generally conforms with their natural heritage policy, or sorry, nat natural hazard policies. Uh, they acknowledged that uh, the exact top of bank st setback and detailed stormwater management design uh, would be done at time of site plan control. Um, the Huron County biologists indicated that they had no concern. Again, they reviewed uh, the EIS study um, and they're satisfied that um, the development will result in no negative impacts on the natural features, provided the recommendations in the report are implemented at time of site plan control. Um, Huron County Public Works similarly indicated no concerns. We did receive comments from uh, staff from the municipality of Morris Turnberry, um, just because the subject site um, is in close proximity to their municipal borders. Um, they did inquire um, about um, 
the preparation of a traffic impact brief uh, just to assess, assess the capacity of the surrounding uh, roads in Morris Turnberry jurisdiction. Um, the Township Director of Public Works and Township Consulting Engineer have reviewed the proposed development um, and have advised that the scale of this size typically would not trigger um, a traffic impact brief or study. Typically, these studies will look at things that um, it would look at the capacity of the roads in terms of if you need an additional left turning lane, um, traffic lights or road widening, so things of that nature. And typically, the scale of this wouldn't um, trigger that type of study. Um, so that um, that information was provided to Morris Turnberry staff. In terms of public comments, um, again, as, as council will note, there were um, a series of written public comments received and included on uh, tonight's agenda package. I have attempted to summarize these comments in my presentation and my report, uh, but council should note that um, there will be an opportunity to receive additional comments tonight and this uh, by no means um, will be the full comprehensive list. Um, but just, just to summarize uh, these comments, so that there were comments uh, about the p potential impact on surrounding property values. Um, there was an opposition to a building of this size uh, and an unappealing building design. Um, in particular, there was one comment that had concern about the building acting as a snow fence, causing drifting of snow on surrounding streets. Uh, the impact of the building height on surrounding properties, including potential loss of sunlight, privacy, noise, and light pollution. Increased traffic on surrounding streets, number of parking spaces, potential overflow parking in surrounding areas. Um, just to continue along to the next slide. Um, there were inquiries about the potential ecological damage to the adjoining natural features um, and in particular from salt, sand and other pollutants that may run off from the development, uh, the loss of trees and potential impact on wildlife, loss of recreation opportunities, um, including a walking trail, the distance of the site to schools, um, concern that the development will not provide affordable options and proposed rent, uh, concern about the capacity of the water treatment plant, hospitals um, and physicians for additional populations and questions about available full servicing to the lot and who will be responsible for the cost. Um, so some of these comments I can provide some clarity on uh, of the ones that are more technical in nature, but um, certainly I will, I will be here for the remainder of the meeting if there's any additional questions. Um, in response to some of the comments on the ecological related comments, uh, it is worth noting, as I said before, an EIS was completed and reviewed uh, by the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority and County bi Biologists. As part of the site plan, it is um, expected that the recommendations of that study will be implemented, um, and particularly with setbacks to the top of banks, site buffering, tree protection and replanting, and stormwater management. Um, will all be implemented as per the direction of the MVC and county biologist. Uh, for comments related to servicing, um, typically uh, for developments, we are mostly focused on water and sanitary sewage servicing. Uh, so as per the, the functional servicing report, it has been confirmed that there is available capacity for this and, and further details would be addressed at site plan control. The developer would be responsible for any engineering installation costs related to um, water and sanitary servicing for this lot. Um, as I stated before, as part of this development, the community trail is proposed to reloc be relocated on the northwest corner of the site. Um, and for further context, certain details such as site lighting um, and snow removal on site would be addressed in further detail at the time of site plant control. Uh, but it is worth noting with that comment with respect to snow removal that there is a proposed location for on site snow removal. Um, and then lastly, as required uh, by the North Huron zoning bylaw, either a planting strip or a fence will be required to be provided on portions of the property that abut uh, any low density residential uses such as single detached dwellings. Um, so there is an opportunity to have some sort of buffering between the site and single detached dwellings. And um, that, that's something we can, we can certainly discuss further with neighbors. Um, so just in terms of my, my recommendation in my report, um, it is recommended that the, count, the council receive my report at this time for informational purposes um, and that as per this public meeting uh, and the public circulation that council receive the verbal and written comments received on these applications um, and that council uh, direct that staff be uh, directed to work with interested parties to see if any resolutions to the issues or concerns can be resolved, uh, particularly as they are uh, as they relate to these amendments. 
um, and that staff be directed to bring back a report to the next uh, regular meeting with a recommendation. Um, and at this time, the, the next uh, regular council meeting would be on Monday, January 17th, uh, 2022. Um, so just in terms of next steps, in, in terms of the process, so as, as the, the clerk did explain before, there is an opportunity to orally receive public comments on the application this evening. Um, there will be an additional planning report, which will include a policy review summary of comments received and a recommendation. Um, and then just to provide a bit more detail on the, the process. So uh, it would be the decision of North Huron Council whether um, to uh, approve these applications, uh, defer or um, deny the applications, uh, but in particular the official plan amendment, um, it would be forwarded uh, to the county for a final decision and, the, and then the zoning bylaw amendment would have a final decision by local council. So just to provide a little bit of clarity on the, uh, on the process, but again, as I stated before, um, it's, it's not anticipated that council would make a decision tonight. It's my recommendation that they uh, receive the report for information and uh, provide an opportunity to receive comments. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have, but um, as I stated before, I'll, I'll be staying around at the meeting. So it might be better that um, I answer questions as they're received by the public or, uh, or if council would like to hold off. So thank you. And, uh, what do you suggest? Clerk, uh, we take just carry on till the uh, the end for uh, the exception of the of the motions. Or? Yeah, yeah. So uh, next, you want to move to six point two point two. Um, yeah. Okay. And we'll carry on from there. Thank you. Yeah. Item six point two point two: uh, the opportunity by of comment by the applicant or the agent. We can hit the lights now too. <coughs> Hi everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so some of you might know me, but I am Brock Hodgins and I'm here tonight re uh, representing myself and Jonathan Neilman, who's the other partner on this uh, proposed development. Um, both of us grew up in the community. We've kind of been here all our lives. Uh, we've, you know, my grandfather, he started at Hodgins Rona. And then after that, uh, I decided to come back and be involved in the community as much as I can. Uh, Jonathan Neilman and his family have been in general contracting and uh, you know same thing his dad was a contractor and now he has started Precision Buildings which is another company in Wingham. Um, when the expression of interest package was kind of made available uh, we saw that the county was requesting high density residential housing and uh, we kind of put together this site plan and reviewed what we thought would fit on the site and uh, this is kind of what we came up with. Obviously, we had to be mindful of there's a gas easement uh, that you had to be mindful of on the east end. There's a sewer easement as well that's on the southwest end. And there's the trail space that we had to be mindful of that we want to keep intact. Um, so when all that was said and done, it really made sense that an apartment building kind of centralized in the lot was the thing that made the most sense. And as we went along, we realized that a cost of a building this size um, is quite expensive and to get the debt servicing ratio to something that was appropriate, we needed to go to five stories instead of the three. So that's kind of why we made the request that we did for the site plan um, and for the rezoning application. So, yeah. And I'll be around all night. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask and we'll do our best to answer them. Okay. Thank you. 6.2.3, the opportunity of comments by others in attendance. Uh, I'd just like to make note that we have uh, one, two, three, four, uh, I believe nine letters uh, uh, submitted uh, to council. The council has had the uh, time to, uh, to uh, read over uh, and in uh, just the chances of not repeating everything, the, uh, if you have uh, new things to add to it, uh, uh, please come up and uh, present your, uh, your questions or your uh, comments, please. Just come up to the to the front microphone here one at a time and state your name for the for the minutes if anyone would like to speak. <coughs> uh, 
Hello, how are you guys? Uh, thank you for hearing me out. Uh, Jeff Hodgkinson. I uh, live at 199 Victoria Street West, two lots from the proposed build. Um, I guess really my, uh, my only concerns uh, would be obviously the height of it because that uh, directly affects the privacy in my backyard and the uh the property value so uh obviously i would assume when i have balconies peering into my backyard that'll directly affect my property value and uh obviously that's not a good thing um other than that there's quite a bit yes there's a, there's there's many things i mean i i do understand the uh the importance of uh, you know economic development, residential development. We do have a housing crisis, but I do believe we also have a development going ahead in Hutton Heights. All that aside, I guess uh, my main concerns are yeah, the traffic as well, but uh, it directly affects um, my property. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> I'm Karen. Hmm. I'm shorter. <laughs> I'm Karen Decker. I live at 137 John Street West. I did send in a letter. I probably will say a couple of things that were in the letter. I appreciate the chance for this meeting and I appreciate Council's willingness to listen. I also appreciate that Jonathan and Brock have done good work and that Hannah has done good work to try and provide information for the whys and wherefores of going ahead with this particular proposal. Having said that, I am very concerned about the neighborhood. And I'm also concerned at the lack of time that was provided for people to really prepare for this. A lot of people were not notified and it was left to a few of us to try and find out why and to get the information out. And for a council and township that prides itself on transparency, prides itself on wanting feedback, wanting to hear from the people in the area, I found this most disturbing. So, some of the concerns that we have, I've learned, and I'm a pretty new kid on the block here, having only lived here for a while, I've learned that people feel quite jaded at times that they don't feel that they have a voice and they have some concerns that if they do speak up, it may not be heard. And I regret having to say that, but it was a constant when we were talking with people. Yes, Wingham needs more housing. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. The Hutton Heights one has been mentioned, but it needs housing that's well-planned and well-located. The difficulty with this apartment building is that five stories is too high and too concentrated in a very small area. So in spite of the fact that you are keen and you are smart young men to do this, it isn't a very compatible thing for the environment. If we cannot continue to have the park area, the open space area, can we at least have a residential piece that makes sense, that isn't looming over other residences and creating huge amounts of traffic. And traffic is a major consideration. So I listen to the studies, I see, Hannah, that there have been many things sent out, and yet I have to admit to some skepticism. It's very difficult to understand that when you take a look at that area, that this is a good thing to put there. The density is too high. People also chose to live there, believing that the bylaws protected them from inappropriate development that would compromise their quality of life 
the environment, the peacefulness, the safety, and home values. For example, a development that preserves as much as possible of the original parkland should be the goal, instead of changing it completely. So if it was housing, that's different. If you could not see your way fit to keep the park area and space, which is well used, then put something in that is consistent and compatible with the residences that are there now. I implore you to do the right thing. And the right thing is that you give this town hope that you are able and willing to hear their concerns and then act upon them. Fix this situation. I'm sorry, Jonathan and Brock, but I think the apartment application and the significant radical bylaw changes that are required and that have short and long-term consequences, it's not a viable thing. It's not good for the community to put an apartment building into that residential area. Pick another site for the apartment building. Pick somewhere that doesn't impact. Look at Listwell and the apartment buildings that have gone there in a field. They look okay. They seem to be fairly normal. This is a park. There's a splash park. There's a daycare center. There's the Legion. There's the Reavy Center. I live on John Street. I see what goes on on John Street. We have witnessed children struggling to get across even with the traffic that is currently there. Imagine a 73 unit building which could bring 100 to 150 more people to that small area. That's radically different from putting in 20 or 30 houses that would enable people to see that, okay, there's a house. Best of all would be to keep that park the way it is. I am very concerned for the safety, very concerned for the safety. There was a little lad on our street in the fall. He and four other kids wanted to save a squirrel that was dead from getting run over and they wanted to bury it on the river bank. As such, they waited for the traffic, they went out, we provided them with a safe way of doing this because they were keen, and then what happened is a car came speeding by so quickly that one of the kids said, you need to slow down, <laughs> please don't go so fast. Okay, multiply that by how many cars that will come out of a 73 unit building. And I'm sorry, I don't have kids, I don't have grandkids, but I do have safety concerns for everyone's kids and for what could happen to them. I am not against the design of the apartment. That's not an issue for me. The issue is, and some of this has been answered now, I was worried about the sewage pipes, the drainage and all of that. You're saying that has been investigated. I was worried about the 30 meter going to 25 meters. Again, you're saying that that will be fine with the site plan. Losing that canopy of trees seems crazy in this time when we are always trying to ensure that we maintain and keep some parkland available in small towns. So again, development is great. There's nothing wrong with development, not anti-development in any way. I am anti this apartment building because of the kinds of things that will happen to that small area and the way in which people will have to work within that area. I don't usually get involved in this kind of thing, so if you want to know how important this is, when I got my letter and found out that people didn't know, I couldn't believe that for an issue like this, 30 people out of 3,000 residents were the only required people that had to be told. And as a result, we ran around trying to inform people, and people were upset. We didn't get to everyone. Door to door is hard. It's hard to do. And it's totally not within my bailiwick of interest. The timing of the meeting. You want transparency? This is the only time that you could have this meeting, 
five days before Christmas to look at a sensitive issue such as this that has such an impact on people. And I got the information of why it's happening now. I get that. But I don't think it follows with your values and principles as a township of community engagement, transparency, integrity, and working for the good of everyone. So show us that that's who you are. The people who care. This is a town that I came to because I thought, and I'm a rural girl, I grew up on a dairy farm, I thought this town would reflect the values that are stated in your website. So do that, and when you hear people who have the concerns that I have heard and that I see sometimes out here, perhaps that will be something that will consider, that you will consider and think about before you put through this application. This is a quiet residential area. Honor the bylaws that protect that. Act with integrity. Give us some hope that you are hearing people. I would reject this application and go back to the drawing board if I were in your shoes. And you could go back to the drawing board and see what's possible. Because five stories, changing a bylaw from three to five, changing the parking spaces, oh, there will be parking trouble as well. So thank you for letting me continue to talk to you. It's a very important issue for everyone in this town. And if you take a walk down to that area, go and look at what that area has and the way in which we need to pay attention. <coughs> Put an apartment building somewhere, but don't squeeze it into that little park. <laughs> Do something else. Thank you. I appreciate this chance and opportunity. And I'm grateful that I got to meet most of you as I was coming in, but not Hannah yet. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, thank you for that response. Uh, just like to, if there's anyone else like to come up to, to, to talk, just please come up to the microphone. I'd just like to remind the, uh, the people in the audience that you are addressing the council, so speak into the microphone uh, so we can uh, have it recorded. Hello, my name is Dan, and I'm speaking on uh, Dave Church's behalf on 203 William Street. And uh, just so, like, I'm not related to him, I'm not, you know. Excuse me, just, excuse me, sir. Can I get a last name, sir? Uh, my name is Dan Noble. I'm David Church on 203 William Street. I'm speaking on his behalf. Thank you. And, well, the first thing is, um, more or less, the safety would be the first thing that uh, comes to anybody's mind. But uh, even during the construction process alone, like I've been working at construction since I was a kid, I don't even own clothes that don't have paint on them or anything like that anymore. So I can, like the uh, impact on the roads, and everything around it, j just during the construction biz, like the aspect of it alone is going to be a nightmare. And uh, I'm not going to say any towns or anything, but I participated where they've tried to do these in other small towns and stuff like that. And like even me myself alone has, has almost run over a kid just trying to get to work in a company truck because the kids aren't used to it. There's a park there. Like it, it's going to take. 10 years of retraining your kids that live in that general area, you know, to start looking twice, three times, five times, when there's equipment flying up and down the road, stuff like that. Like, uh, you know, when bosses start pushing their employees, you know, sometimes they get a little bit rammy. S things like that tend to cause, well, problems, and big ones. And, you know, Dave, he moved here from Kitchener, and he was, surrounded by apartment buildings. That's why he moved up here. So that kind of totally defeats the purpose of him moving to this town. Like a lot of other people in this, that general area, it's just gonna destroy the world. Like, I mean, and you're drawing, like a people who rent apartments don't care, like people that own houses, right? They're 10 times more reckless. They're, they're just all around crazier people. Now, if you're gonna pack all those crazier people right beside people who are trying to retire, that's going to cause problems. 
and like just like the snow fencing alone like Dave points out that it's going to ma cause a massive snow fence now you're going to have you're going to have snow piles that you can't even see around so you might as well just you know you won't even be able to keep the stop signs clear so you can see the darn things <laughs> so like it's uh like that's why they made these laws like the zoning laws bylaw laws so I'm pretty sure when you make a proposal and you have to alter a whole pile of laws to make it work, that should be a red flag right there, should it not? <laughs> At least I don't know, I've tried to alter a lot of laws in my day, never worked out. So, you know, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? You step up on the mic, state your name. Okay, my, my name is Michael Woodman at 137 John Street West. I had a presentation here which I'll, I'll have to edit a little bit because uh, Hannah has addressed some of my concerns and the opinion polls and so forth. But I, I'd just like to add, um, after attending the open house presented by the builders, the applicants, I was very concerned by the answers I got to my questions and general discussion about the building on the Shaler Park. They assumed retiring farmers, people selling their houses to avoid upkeep, people over 55 who apparently no longer drive, and workers seeking housing in Wingham for employment based on assumptions with no marketing data. Traffic flow congestion, no data additional stress to existing infrastructure and utilities, no data. Shade study, no data. The fact that so many zoning bylaw changes were required to fit this thing five stories high into a trailer park surrounded, sounded very challenging. The mature tree canopy would be completely gone, as would the park usage, with no mention of parkland replacement elsewhere. All points of discussion were aimed at the inevitable success of this project without the slightest consideration for existing residents and their established quality of life or being neg negatively affected. Many Wingham residents still hold the belief that the trailer park land would be used for affordable housing, whereas this application is pursuing market value rents. These facts add up to an extremely risky venture for the builders. And this has bad idea written all over it for the local neighborhood. Unbelievably, only 30 out of nearly 30,000 Wingham residents received an invitation to this meeting. I'm aware that the township wished to sell this piece of land, but surely there must be a more appropriate use for it. And its design should integrate and preserve the site where possible. And th this is a distillation of a larger letter that you already have. And it, th that's all I'm going to say so someone else can have a turn. But thank you for listening and uh, thank you for providing this opportunity. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Not seeing anyone else. Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Bob Donnelly. I live on William Street. Um, I've heard a couple of people ask about, uh, including the first gentleman that spoke, about uh, how it affects property values of the people that already live there and chose that location for a reason. I haven't heard an answer or I didn't see anything in the presentation regarding that. Um, there's also, I'm not sure if this was brought up tonight, but policing, uh, ambulance, hospital, doctors, uh, 73 units, does our uh, medical center support that? 
Uh, it's just a couple more things I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, did anyone just step up to the mic? for letting me speak. My name is Casey Smith. I also live in the neighborhood not far from the proposed disaster. I live near to where the proposed disaster is going to happen, I imagine. And uh, I don't have children here. I don't have grandchildren at all. And I walk with this. And I'm not the only senior that walks and walks and walks all over this town. Every morning, I see the walkers. Every afternoon, I see the walkers. In the evening, I see the walkers. A lot of seniors walking. A lot of young people, young mothers with strollers. Little kids in them, little kids hanging on, dogs tagging along somewhere. Everybody uses the area to walk. If there's all that extra traffic, and by the way, in the wintertime, the sidewalks are not plowed. Where are people going to walk? If the park is gone for summertime use, if it's not safe to walk anytime, where are people going to walk? There is the trail, but if you're proposing moving the trail, I haven't seen in feet on the ground how close to the riverbank they're going to get, but sometimes it's really busy on that trail. So there's got to be room for people to go. Just a thought. That's along with all the other concerns that have been mentioned. That is one thing. Everybody's talking about little kids, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the new generation kids, the ones that are blonde again. Where are we going to go? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sheila Marklovitz and I live at 227 Minnie Street and I'm right on the corner of Minnie and John and I'd really like to know why we didn't get a letter. I think if we are taxpayers in this town, a letter should have been sent out to every taxpayer, just not a handful. I'm understanding that there's people here that live closer than I do and they never got letters. So that's one question I would really like somebody to answer me. Another thing is, 72 units, 73 units, one parking spot per unit. There's like a lot of people that are 55 and older that both parties work. Both parties go different directions. So where's the overflow gonna park? You're not gonna get the renters if you can't have double parking. Another thing is, living on a corner lot, it is very dangerous. I have seen so many kids, so many adults try and cross the streets, and it's dangerous. I see cars going through the intersection all the time. So I think you need to really sit back and think about what is going to happen here on John Street, Edward Street, Leopold, all these streets that are joining on to this and really stop and think about our safety. You guys, some of you guys don't live in this town. We do. Okay, seeing no other, couldn't see you over the corner there. Go ahead, sir. Hi, my name is Tom Montgomery. I'm a resident on William Street 215. Uh, this is the first time I've ever had to do something like this, so I'm a little nervous. So I hope it's okay if I ask a few questions. 
First of all, I'd like to ask if there's any zoning or building bylaws that this building does not actually violate, because it seems like pretty well all of them are. Um, um, who? Living across the street from where they want to build this, I was in town hall just this past summer inquiring about what kind of garage I could build, and I was told I could not go higher than 14 feet. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the point of zoning bylaws is to protect the people who invest in living in that community, right? Like, there's definitely a difference between high and low residential volumes. And on your maps, you did not specificate that, the difference. And I'm wondering, is there any other high density residential zonings in Wingham? Is this going to be the densest, highest, most compact building in Wingham? And is there anything else to compare to? Which I don't think there is, right? We're very concerned about how this was released to the public. It was very hush hush behind closed doors. When I first heard that they were selling that for housing, I thought that'd be great. Some entry family homes in there, exactly like the ones that are it's surrounded by in the community. Like, maybe I have a little bit of experience. Some people here don't. I've actually owned property that this, the same thing has happened to. And I guarantee you it will drop your property value. It will increase traffic. It will increase crime. They try to say it's only for seniors. I believe that's ageism. You know, not allowed to do that. And they say, oh, it's not going to be low income housing. It's going to be, well, if this building doesn't get fully rented out, they will rent to anyone and everyone. And that's including anyone that can pay for it, basically. So they can't really say that. And oh, what else? I don't know, I think it's really concerning that, I don't know, that there's so much conflict of interest on that stage before we even got up here. Like, I received my letter not until after the first meeting, which was specifically uh, on Halloween, just like how this one's on Christmas, often very busy, busy times for people with not much notice. and. The whole thing is just very, very concerning. The fact that I even have to come down here and say this, like I thought these zoning bylaws were there to protect us, not to, not to be played around with, basically destroying my in investment in this town, which you know I grew up in and really held cherish, dearly, cherishly growing in this small town. And now to have these big, high dense, like commercial residential buildings built right in the heart of our home is almost an insult to the people of this town. And uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hodgins, if uh, this is the kind of service you're bringing to my community, please stay uh, away from my community. I don't want it. Point of order, sir. Oh, sorry, I, I point didn't of order, anything sir. bad by that. I'm just saying, I don't want. Point of order, sir. What's that mean? You're, you're addressing council. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. So I'd just like to address just the council and saying that I hope that you take the interests of the people that invested in the community instead of like profits for other people. Because really they say that this is best interest for Wingham, but it's really just the best interest for the people that are going to make one and a half million rent revenue. Like give a chance for young families to buy and own and raise a family in this town. I suggest single family homes in there. There's no reason that couldn't have already been done. Thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. You you had you said you were uh, you had a question you wanted answered. Did you do you know who you wanted? Well, I want to know. I asked a few questions about the building bylaws that aren't being violated here. The and if, uh, Please come back up to the microphone if you want to. I'm sorry. Like I said, I don't have anything prepared, and I wasn't really expected to do this, but I felt obligated because of what I've been through in the past with building condos. Just you had, you had a question. I just wondered if you wanted to answer. Well, I'm just wondering: is this many zoning bylaws, or zoning change, and this many building bylaw changes typical for this sort of thing, or is this sort of special treatment 
Would you like, I guess I'll, I'll put that one over to Hannah, the, the building. Because uh, to me that putting high, high density residential please in the heart your, of low residential is just sir. wrong. Sir, please let her, let her answer your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Um, through your worship, can you hear me okay? No. Okay. I don't, is that better? I can hear you. That's sorry. Okay. Um, so your question about are there any building bylaws not being changed? So what what I went over my presentation about the, the three zone provisions that they're asking relief from. So, so the setback to the top of the bank, the building height and the parking spaces. Um, those are the only bylaw provisions that they're asking relief from. Otherwise, the proposal meets the other requirements that are as part of the, the R3 zone. Yeah, they meet the requirements of the change zoning law. Correct. But I'm, I'm suggesting that it would be unfair to the residents that invested in the area to change to make that change. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just for a point of clarification, the uh, the open house uh, that was at the uh, Legion for the uh, uh, for this project uh, had no connection whatsoever with council or the township of North Huron. That was strictly uh, provided by the uh, by the applicants. So the, that wasn't uh, had, doesn't have anything to do with uh, foregoing notice uh, of the of this project. That was strictly uh, on their uh, their agenda. So not seeing anyone else. This is the uh, opportunity of questions uh, and comments from council members. Uh, does council uh, wish to make any comments or have any questions? Somebody's coming uh, Thank you, the council, for letting me speak. I'm George David Church. I live at 203 William Street. And I'd look out my front door right into the side of that apartment building. It will greatly lower my property values without question. Now I lived for 24 years beside a 12 plex down in Kitchener. I was in an independent house but I can tell you that buildings of high density like this destroy the whole area they are in. They taint it. You think that you've got units. Okay, we've got a single family drilling unit. To meet the prices involved, what you involve is get two people into the same unit. You know, they'll share the rent, they'll share the apartment. But gee, they got two cars or pickup trucks. Uh, there's greater problems with policing. And that I sadly know about down there, because I witnessed drug takedowns off of balconies into my backyard and the whole bit. It was a bad experience, and when my wife and I decided to retire, we wanted a small town. That's why we came here. We wanted that ambiance. Uh, there's one last thing I would like to mention. I've been an industrial designer for nearly 40 years. And many of you will have used products that I designed, but I'm not going to go into that. When I saw the drawings of the building and the layouts of the plan, I was struck immediately by how absolutely wrong that building is for that location. I understand that the city, we need housing in this city, but my beef is don't put up a five-story tall, block-long, slab-sided monstrosity and expect quality of life on that side of Josephine Street to not be affected. you will be able to see that building from the highway. It will be a blight in the middle of the valley. One last thing. Excuse me, please. 
that would be all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to get caught off guard again. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> else? <laughs> All right, thank you. 6.2.4, opportunity of questions, comments from the council members. Not seeing any. 6.2.5, procedures following the public meeting. Zoning bylaw procedure following a public meeting. This is a public meeting of the council of the township of North Huron. Thus, a decision the council may or may not be made this evening on the zoning bylaw and the amendments. If the zoning bylaw is passed by council, the clerk is required to send notice of the passing of the bylaw to persons or public bodies that have made written requests to be notified in the decision. There is a 20-day oblig uh, obligation, or excuse me, a 20-day objection period from the time of the notice of the passing of the bylaw has been made, has been made and mailed by the first class post, wherein submissions, letters of objections or support in, the, in request to the passing of the bylaw will be received by the clerk. If an objection is received, an appeal is lodged with the Ontario Land Tribunal, and at that point the township has no longer has any control over the time factor involved. If council does pass a bylaw, an applicant, or excuse me, if the council does not pass the bylaw, the applicant may appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal themselves. Uh, if, the, if the bylaw is passed and no objections are received within the objection period, the clerk certifies that the bylaw is in force and the effect of as date is, is of its passing and notice forwarded to the Huron County Planning Development and Department. The official plan member, mem amendment procedure following a public meeting. This is a public meeting of the Council of Township of North Huron. Thus, a decision of council may or may not be made this evening the official, or on the official plan amendment. If the official plan, plan amendment is adopted by council, the clerk is required to send a record to the county of Huron of the decision. If the amendment is approved, the county is required to send notice of passing of the amendment to the persons or public bodies that have made written requests to, the, to be notified of this decision. There is a 20-day objection period from this time of the notice of passing of the amendment, whereas submissions, letters of objection, or support in requests to the passing of the bylaw may be received. If an objection is received, an appeal will be lodged with, will be lodged with the Ontario Land Tribunal, and at that point the, the county and the township no longer have any control over the, factor, the time factor involved. If council does adopt or does not, excuse me, a lot of reading here. If council does not adopt an amendment, the application may appeal to the land tribunal, excuse me, the Ontario land tribunal. If the amendment is approved and no objections are received within the objection period, the clerk certifies that the amendment is in force and of effect as of the date of its passing. 6.2.6, uh, summary of comments and recommendations of the Huron County Planning Development Department. Back to Hannah. Where do you, Thank do you, you. need the uh, yeah. lights uh, off again? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay. okay. I will just go back to the recommendation. Um, so we can we can start with uh, my my report recommendation if if that suits council. Sure. Um, so the, the recommendation is uh, on the screen here and also included in my report. If, if council would like, I can uh, read that recommendation again, if that's preferred. I would prefer that, yeah, I can okay, see great. it. So. Thank you. Uh, it is recommended, uh, first, that the council of the Township of North Huron hereby receives the report of the planner on applications OPA 15 and Z0721 dated December 15, 2021 for information purposes. And further, that council hereby receives the verbal and written comments received on the application OPA 15 and Z0721 
and further that staff be directed to work with the interesting interested parties to see if uh, resolutions to the issues and concerns can be resolved and that further that staff be directed to bring back a report to the next regular meeting with a recommendation on applications OPA 15 and Z0721. Thank you. Uh, I guess we can have that light back on again for council, please. Okay, that uh, motion is on the floor from the uh, Huron County Director that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby receive the report of the planning planner regarding the application OPA 15 Z07-21 dated December 15th 2021 for information purposes and further the council hereby receive the verbal and written comments received on this application OP 15 and uh, Z07-21 and further the staff being directed to work with the intended parties to see if a resolution to the issue and the concerns can be resolved and further the staff be directed to bring back a report to the next regular council meeting on the recommendations on the application of OP 15 uh, Z07-21. Do I have a mover? I have Anita and a seconder. I have Paul. Uh, any questions or comments before? I call the vote. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. I guess we're on seven point. We can wake the we can wake the reeve up. I can see why you like the power of the gavel. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very kindly, uh, Councilor Faulkner, for stepping in there and taking. Uh, Hold of this situation. Leave her on to uh, seven. You got reports. Seven. Yeah. Yep. Reports. We have no clerks or finance report. Uh, we have Director uh, Darcy Chapman, 7.2.1 Asset Retirement Obligations. That the Council of Township of North Huron hereby receives our presentation. First, he's going to give us the presentation. Members of Council, uh, so we're here tonight to talk about asset retirement obligations, which is a uh, accounting standard. So it certainly is not going to be an exhilarating topic like the one that you guys just went through, um, but it is something that I believe is important for all the members of Council to understand. So uh, we'll talk about what an, an asset retirement obligation actually is. Uh, I'll highlight the ARO standard for uh, Council. Uh, most importantly, of course, then we'll talk about key implications of the new standard for municipalities and then how those uh, implications actually affect North Huron. So um, the Deputy Reeve, of course, might find this uh, exciting because of uh, his profession, but I'm not too sure everybody else will. So in, in accounting terms, an asset retirement obligation uh, describes a legal obligation associated with the retirement of a tangible capital asset where a municipality will be responsible for removing equipment or cleaning up hazardous materials at some future date. So for those people who aren't, uh, you know, accounting uh, folks. Second, Darcy. If, if, if folks, folks, we're having a meeting, so I'd really appreciate if we'd be able to hear what the speaker's saying. Thank you kindly for coming out. Go ahead, Darcy. Thank you very much, ma'am. We're conducting a public meeting here. We have done it several times. We're going by the bylaws of Ontario and Canada. Please, please, please. Thank you very kindly. Go ahead, Darcy. Thank you, sir. So in, in layman's terms, what it really means is that 
it's when a municipality is legally or contractually bound to incur future costs to remediate a building or land which transparently has to be shown within the annual financial statements. So, uh, you know, if, if we have a requirement moving forward, we are now going to have to show that requirement on our books. So where did this come from? So the ARO standard was issued by the Public Sector Accounting Standards Board in August of 2018. Uh, it was actually supposed to be effective this year, but because of the pandemic, it got pushed off. Uh, so um, it, it, what it really means is that for anybody that's uh, operating under public sector accounting standards, the first set of financial statements after April 1st, 2022 uh, will, will have to show the new requirements. So for, for us as a municipality, since we have fiscal years that run from January to December, it means that the first year that will be impacted for us will be 2023. So council will see this uh, at the end of December of 2023. Uh, the, the standard establishes how to account for and report for the liabilities of AROs. Uh, and the reason behind this, it's very similar to the, the requirements under PSAB 3150, which happened back in 2007, that required municipalities to start accounting for tangible capital assets. Uh, the intention behind this is it, it gets public sector accounting up to a standard that the private sector has been kind of mandated to follow through international financial reporting standards for a number of years. Uh, the other factor that needs to be included within this is that uh, a current standard that we operate under, which is PS 3270, which is solid waste landfills, will no longer exist once we, once we actually incorporate this new standard into our, our books. So the, the old requirements on the, the landfill uh, will be gone because everything will be incorporated into this new standard. So uh, what does an asset retirement obligation apply to? Uh, it applies to any tangible capital asset that is controlled either by a way that we actually own it or that we have a, a lease with uh, that is either in productive use or it could potentially be no longer in productive use as well. So it's anything that we own or lease that we're either using or that we have used in the past. It can, of course, relate to different environmental requirements for things like remediation of landfills, uh, but it also doesn't have to include uh, something that is in excess of an environmental standard. So if we've entered into a leasehold agreement that forces us to uh, bring a property or a building back to the standard that we had it at at the time of the, the original lease, that is also considered uh, a retirement obligation. So at the end of the lease, we would have to pay money to to reinstate something. Uh, what it doesn't apply to is acquiring new assets, replacing or maintaining the assets that we have, uh, any costs related to improper use or unexpected events, uh, having to retrofit assets for different uses. Uh, it doesn't include to things like sewage waste that would come from our wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, and it also doesn't include any costs related to the sale of an asset. Um, it also um, limits uh, the requirements for liabilities for contaminated sites, which we've had to account for for the last number of years. So this is specifically uh, about productive sites or non-productive sites that are outside the realm of uh, pre-existing contaminated sites that we already knew about. So generally, what does this mean for, for municipalities? It means that uh, we're going to have to evaluate retirement costs um, and that's going to require additional study and a higher level of accounting rigor going forward than what we had to apply in the past. It means that buildings that contain any hazardous materials uh, or contaminated sites, solid waste landfills, so on and so forth, that didn't have retirement costs uh, fully shown on our books will now have to show those retirement costs. So this is going to create new challenges for municipalities to meet the standards, of course. Uh, and although we've uh, in the past always accounted for an active landfill closure cost, the way in which we have to show it on the books is going to be completely different. Uh, and it is going to impact our financial statements moving forward. Uh, so there are, there are three steps uh, in the ARO process. The first that we have to do uh, as, as uh, the Township of North Huron is identify any assets that we currently have that 
are, that may fall within the scope of the ARO requirements under PS 3280. So this can include, of course, our landfills, any buildings with asbestos, uh, lands that we have fuel tanks on, uh, any lands that either currently or may have been used as machine shops, wastewater treatment plants and lagoon systems, uh, any fire water holding tanks and gravel pits. And there's also, like, there's a long list, but these are some or most that may actually uh, pertain to, to North Huron. The, the second thing that we then have to do is determine for each of those assets that falls within the scope if it meets all of the recognition criteria. So the first thing is, is there has to be a legal obligation to incur those costs, either being some kind of envir envir environmental requirement or a leasehold requirement, so on and so forth. So there has to be an obligation for us to spend money at the end of its life. The, the pa past transaction or event has to show the liability. So that means that we either have to, uh, we know that we've, we've purchased it, so we own it, or we've entered into some kind of an agreement. It, it's expected that future economic benefit will be given up. What that means is that it, we have to show that at some point in time, the township is going to have to use taxpayers or, or user rate dollars in order to remediate something. So we are losing future economic benefit. And there is a reasonable estimate that can be made of that total cost. So all four of those things have to be determined in order for it to meet the standard. Specifically under legal obligations, I, I was mentioning that um, you know, there's a, a requirement at some point uh, in, in time for some of our assets under environmental requirements. Uh, but there could also be a clear duty or responsibility that we have based on other kinds of agreements or contracts that we have, provincial or federal government legislations, any municipal bylaws that we've passed, or if we own property in a neighboring municipality, any municipal bylaws that they may have passed, uh, or of course a promise to a third party to perform uh, some kind of remediation. So if through a leasehold agreement, we've, we've agreed to, to some form of future requirement uh, through that lease. So then the last step that we have to, to do, if, if we get all of our list of all of the potential uh, properties and facilities, and then we've narrowed that down to say that they meet all four of the criteria, the last thing that we then have to do is we have to somehow come up with an estimate of that retirement obligation, which will include costs directly attributable to uh, the asset retirement activity, and so that can include, you know, real costs for a post-retirement uh, operation, maintenance. It, it could also include costs for staff or vehicles, machinery uh, that may be used to still perform that maintenance and operation after the closure of that facility. So we have to come up with some kind of a, uh, a legitimate expectation of total costs overall. So that, that once we've met those three standards, we then have a final list. Uh, so the, the best thing that uh, the industry has kind of said and, and you know, major accounting firms is that the reality is, is that we can't use TCA data, so, so past data on the cost of the asset to establish it. We should be using professional judgment, uh, you know, moving forward to determine costs. What this really means then is that we have to engage people outside of the kind of the, you know, municipality proper, either through consultants, engineers, so on and so forth, uh, to come up with an, an overall cost and a measurement technique to understand the total cost. Uh, and then uh, use a, a present value calculation to be able to show that cost in today's dollars to be able to put it onto the books. Uh, and, and on an annual basis, we have to go through this same accounting process with every asset that we've got. And if for some reason costs have gone up or gone down with regards to that retirement obligation, we then have to adjust our financial statements accordingly on an annual basis. So what does this specifically mean for North Huron? So the, the advantage, of course, is that adopting PS3280 will help us long term in alleviating any potential issues of sudden or unforeseen costs related to, to future liabilities or these planned expenses. Um, again, something like this may have helped us a couple of years ago. I know specifically uh, when the Armory's building uh, was torn down, there was, there was some fairly significant costs for 
asbestos removal in that facility. Uh, the ARO standard would have, sh if it had been adopted at the time, would have shown that there was asbestos in the building and there would have been an analysis that would have said this is what the general cost would have been to remove that asbestos. So we would have been planning for that expense instead of having to bear it uh, in the year that the facility was actually demolished. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a good thing because it helps us with long-term planning. Uh, on on the, the flip side, of course, of this is that especially true for those municipalities like us which are smaller in size we are most likely going to incur costs that we otherwise wouldn't have in the short term to complete assessments uh, especially on our facilities to determine what if any hazardous materials are in those buildings and then what type of remediation would be required in the cost of that remediation Uh, so as well, I've talked quite a bit about the statements and I think that this is one of the reasons why I want to make sure that this council is aware of this standard, uh, that for every asset retirement obligation that we determine to have over the next uh, period of time, the financial statements will show a general description of the liability, the methods used to calculate the asset retirement costs, the basis for the, the estimate for the liability, uh, and a reconciliation uh, of that if there are any outside sources of revenue that may be coming in to try and help offset it uh, through those estimated recoveries. Uh, so our financial statements are going to look drastically different. The best example that we can use is the, the landfill uh, right now. So right now, every year, our statements show a landfill post-closure liability. But what it, the statements show is the in-year cost only of that book liability, which for us right now, give or take, is about $20,000 a year. So there is a, a cost that's shown within the financial statements for that annual use of the landfill, let's call it. As we establish the asset retirement obligations, what's going to happen is our financial statements is actually going to show a total liability of about $1.3 million dollars. Because right now we have a report from the, the engineers that show that the total post-closure cost for that, that landfill is about $1.3 million. So our statements are going to show that we have a liability and that we're going to need to determine over the period of the life of that liability how we're actually going to fund it. That's why we're now not going to have any more, you know, ahas or, or unforeseen expenses because it's going to be shown there and we're going to have to plan to actually fund it. That's why it's, it's critically different, uh, you know, as we establish this, this standard. So we have about two years to get us to December of 2023. Uh, we're early in the process and we are going to have to prioritize this work over the next two years to make sure that we can implement this properly. Uh, we, of course, are going to have to engage our audit firm to make sure that whatever we produce, they're satisfied with, uh, and it meets their, their rigor as well to make sure that they can provide it in our, our overall financial statements. The one thing that I can say, um, you know, I was pleasantly surprised with uh, when I got here. Don has done a lot of work on the facility side of things over the last couple of years. There's been some facility condition assessments that were completed. Uh, to help out with, with TCA, but she knew that this was coming along as well. So as part of those facility assessments, there was basic assessments done on, on at least all of our larger facilities to understand if there was any, um, you know, asbestos or any kind of hazardous materials in buildings. So I have a list to work off of now uh, where we've literally got, you know, eight or nine facilities that we're probably going to have to do some more detailed analysis on, um, but we're starting down the process. Uh, like I mentioned the landfill, there's already been a uh, full accounting exercise done on the landfill liability. So we know what that total liability already is. Now it's just about managing that through the financial statement. So uh, Don has done a lot of work to try and help get us there. It's just the, the last uh, push over the next two years. And I wanted to bring this forward to council uh, specifically so that you're aware about it. Uh, you knew what the changes were going to be to financial statements but also uh, you know to get you the understanding that at some point in time over the next 12 months most likely we as staff as we uncover these things and start running through this process 
may have to bring reports forward to council to request monies that were that aren't budgeted at this stage of the game in order to do different assessments or to complete different engineering exercises to get us ready to adopt this standard. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions of council. Thank you very much, Darcy. Council, questions, comments, concerns? Go ahead, Kevin, then Paul. Okay. Thank you, three of you. Uh, the question I have, because it pertains to uh, uh, sewers and lagoons and such, uh, and some assets um, that may require, as you say, uh, extra uh, thought on the financing going forward. On assets that we share cross border, how does that how does that go into that because we can't charge them or is there is there legislation that says that we can pass their portion of that problem since this has to be uh, evaluated by each municipality do we integrate them into our process or the other way around or uh, or does this lead us to segregation uh, through there's, there's, that's that's just, a great question. Just before you start, I maybe try to bring you up. I'm not sure if any of the staff had a chance to bring you up to uh, speed on what's happening. So north here on, on both borders, the north and the south. On the north, we've put in piping, water and sewer, and supply piping, water and sewer to our neighbors. The municipality itself uh, over there will not pay a penny. They say it's all user pay, which we don't see as fair, of course, because we have user pay here, plus we have put the initial cost of the the equipment in to the south we have the same problem so now we have put piping into the south in years gone by into another municipality and again they're not their municipality is paying nothing for it we have the legal obligation to make sure that meets a certain standard at our costs and we're not getting anything back for it uh, we do charge I think it's one and a half times the end user as compared to if you're an end user in North Huron. But I think when you start looking at the finance, you'll see where that's just, that's just not going to cut it as you're talking about now. Giving you that little bit of information, if that helps, go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, for the clarification, Your Worship. So I think it's twofold. Uh, you know, part of it is if it's water and sewer related, um, you know, and we're not alone, like all 400 plus municipalities, or at least those that provide mm -hmm. water and sewer services, are required through drinking water quality management standards legislation to have plans that show full cost recovery. So if we incur or, or need to book additional costs because of the ARO standard, we'll just need to pass those costs on to the end user over time. So what it'll mean is an increase in the water and sewer rates ultimately, that, that's the end result. If it's not related to water and sewer, I mean, if we had a, a, a joint venture in like a, a landfill or something with a neighboring municipality, uh, the requirement would be that we would have to determine through prior agreements or uh, I think it would have to be some kind of a prior agreement as to what the obligation was. So this isn't uh, significantly different from the tangible capital asset standards that were adopted in 2007. So for um, like municipalities that had uh, border roads or bridges, things like that. Each municipality came up with a joint way of determining that cost and then booked half of the cost of that bordering asset between the two municipalities. So we would have to go through some kind of a process for those assets as well to determine who was liable for each piece. Um, I think, Paul, you were next. Yes, to you, Reeve, uh, to Darcy. Uh, you said in one year you have to have sort of the assets and the dollar value that it's going to get, I, I think you said. Is yeah, so through your worship. So we have until December of 2023 to make sure that we have all the information necessary to build that into our year-end statements for, for the 2023 uh, audit process. So uh, the reality is, is, you know, we'll probably take the mo most of this year to go through step one and step two that I explained. And then for any, especially for high priority assets or assets that may take longer to try and understand cost implications, it might be near the end of, of this year, like of 2022, when we as staff have to bring things forward to get, you know, it might even be just pre-budget approval before 2023 to start getting the funds necessary to do some of this work so that we can 
understand the cost implications so it can be built into into the final product. Thank you. Anita, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, no, thank you. It's, uh, it's okay. Go ahead, Trevor. Yes, Ree. Yes, Ree. Thank you very much. Um, Darcy, wondering if you could just explain, um, you know, let's use the landfill for an example because we actually have a cost from an engineer that tells us that. So, my, my, I guess my question for the taxpayer, what is the taxpayer going to see and how will that change in accounting standards affect the distribution of taxes and what they may or may have to pay for? I mean, arguably that's the argument, that's, that's really the conversation that we're going to have to communicate as to how, how costs, because our taxes are based on costs, that's how taxation is, is determined for the most part, net costs, how is that going to change so that we can properly respond to the taxpayer that says, you know, we didn't make this change, you know, accounting standards made this change, we have to obligate to it based on the, the laws of Ontario and, and that. Here's, here's what this is going to impact. So I guess my question to you is, is that these changes that we're going to make are going to have some impact to taxation in one way, shape, or form. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship, I, I guess it will probably have a, a greater impact to taxation now than it would have in the future. The reality is, is, you know, what the Public Sector Accounting Board is requesting municipalities to do is to uh, do an adequate job of properly thinking about those obligations for the future and starting to plan how to finance them now. So instead of waiting until 40 years from now when the landfill closes and then worrying about how to pay for you know, $1.3 million and then probably having to tax the taxpayers in the future to recover that even though they can't use the landfill, you're now going to be taxing them now. So the reality is the benefit of this is, especially for those larger ticket items, like a post-closure liability in a landfill, you get far better intergenerational equity out of those costs. Because what we need to do is book the expense now, but we also need to show how we're going to fund the expense annually as we go through the process. So that means that the current taxpayer, like it's the greatest example of the landfill, the current taxpayer should be paying that proportionate share of the use of that landfill, the cost of closing it, each year as we go through the process. So that by the time, you know, year 40, year 50, whatever it is, the last year of operation of that landfill, there's enough money in the piggy bank to close it, to cap it, and to have money to monitor it for the next 25 years thereafter as required by legislation. Reeve, I just wanted to follow up just as we follow um, and I mean, I think really my comment is too, is ultimately this is really going to match with the whole asset management piece. Well. Like, I mean, our asset management plan is going to have, in theory, <laughs> going to have all of these costs associated to what it is at the end of retirement life and what our, our, our reserve infrastructure needs to be to match this funding. I mean, ultimately that's where, asset management has to go i mean and the municipalities need to get on board and i think not not just small and rural but everybody needs to get on board to understand that you know our infrastructure deficit we're not alone we're not alone in as a small rural municipality you know and we're not going to be the only one after in 2023. We're, everybody is still going to have a potential infrastructure deficit that they're going to have to deal with. I think ultimately what this is going to resonate to, to us and future councils from now is really what is our obligation? Because really at this point, no council in a four year period really truly understands what their obligation is in 25 years. We really don't. I mean, we look at a balance sheet as a point in time, and I mean, that was be my question is, when you talk about pro, uh, present valuing, you're present valuing those costs, those future costs to today's date. So I mean, they're only going to go one way, and it isn't going to go down. 
in my sen in, in at least in my um, in, in my economics the way it's been working so far not a lot of those costs are going to go down in, in, in hindsight so uh, I appreciate uh, you know I appreciate Darcy you given this information now I think it's going to be more um, you know it's going to be more up for the future councils to learn this type of stuff because it's going to impact them more and more as we go through the process yeah. I, I would, I would uh, go ahead Anita Yes, Darcy, does this mean that now we have um, um, landfill reserves, and I take that as an example, does it mean that we get an extra line in that for landfill reserves for a replacement of the compactor or something like that, and then a, um, a closure cost line, or how does it work for us, how, how will we see this in our... Uh, through your worship, in effect, uh, yes, we will have to start planning for the actual... Uh, future costs for the the post closure so not only will we have to be saving for that that compactor that we need to replace 10 years from now we should be putting we'll need to put money away every year to offset the the post closure cost so uh it'll, it'll almost mean like establishing a separate dedicated uh, reserve fund for post closure costs that every year we put you know the necessary amount away based on the tonnage that we're putting into the landfill uh, and um, you know Jamie's group does uh, through through uh, the engineers they do an assessment every three years as to you know the amount of waste that's gone in so we would average that out for the next three year cycle and keep saving money um, but again uh, again to you know to Donna's credit uh, as you know she's leaving out the door uh, she's done a great job because it's certainly not that there's a million dollars in the reserve and there's nothing to worry about um you know but over the last number of years as we've had some surpluses especially with some of the waste management side of things money has been going into some of those reserves to help you know plan for that because she knew that this was coming down the pipe so so i think from, from my personal point of view i look at it this way we talk about the environment a lot and how we've managed to destroy the environment over the last hundred years and i don't think anybody's going to deny that what we're trying to do here is instead of destroying we're trying to get ready and fix it so we need to start putting money away and we need to start using our resources more meaningfully they're they're not evident we've got to take care of them when they come to an end instead of having our great grandchildren pay for all the stuff we dumped in there what we're saying is let's start putting money away so we can pay for the stuff we dumped in there not our great grandchildren when it has to close and I think if we all, that's personally the way I look at it. Anyway, is uh, we've just got used to using everything and not paying for it. And um, I think it's time that, and I think uh, upper tier governments have realized that we can't go on that way. Whether it's the environment, whether it's your dump, whether it's buildings, we've got, we use it. We're sitting here using it. We should be keeping it the upkeep and, and money for uh, taking it down when it needs to be taken down. Anybody else? Seeing none, can I get a motion for 7.2.1, which is asset retirement obligations? Do I have a mover? I will move. Moving, move. Trevor seconding. I'll second read. Uh, last chance for questions, comments, or concerns. Seeing none, I call the vote. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Uh, Darcy, you're up with reserve and reserve fund policy amendments. Is there anything to bring up on the screen here? No. Um, and so that's that's actually the last presentation. So you can actually hit the power uh, button on the projector there. If you okay. Is it gonna go off? Ah. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Oh, well. oh, it's fine. There's nothing. There's no other oh, presentations. No. I hit that one once. Yeah. Oh, there we okay. go. It just took a second to think. Kevin, did you not notice that was staring? <laughs> Okay, Dars, um, I'm not sure if you want to talk to this one or you just want us to uh, ask questions, but it's the, to do with the reserve, uh, and res uh, reserve and reserve fund policy amendments. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Reed Bailey. Um, there, there isn't a, a formal policy at this stage of the game through uh, that, that the Township of North Huron has adopted in the past, so uh, this is something that I was used to working with in uh, prior municipalities, so I'm I've uh, dragged this along with me. Uh, I think it's advantageous uh, to have a policy uh, that actually dictates how you would establish reserves and reserve funds. Uh, and then more specifically, 
uh, if the policy gets adopted, um, then what we would be doing is bringing forward individual reports or maybe uh, joint reports on, on existing funds that we have with um, draft bylaws for adoption so that those bylaws then uh, can get approved by council uh, and it then becomes very clear as to the intent and the purpose of the use of the funds and it provides uh, a solid policy framework and then direction for staff as to how to manage those funds and how they would be used on an annual basis through the budget process to help offset costs. I will move the uh, recommended motion, Reef. Second. Do I have a second, Paul? Um, just to go to questions, Darcy, I just want to just uh, pick up on something here. So we're in our budget period now. We're talking about existing funds for this and maneuvering the existing. We're not creating for the next few years. We're not dedicating when this comes through at the next meeting a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year towards a fund like oblivious of what the budget looks like i just want to confirm that no yes you're, you're correct your worship this is just about existing funds so um, things are, are pretty good right now as far as being um, separated and segregated out uh, but there's nothing formal right now other than the spreadsheet that Don has been keeping for forever as to saying what the money is supposed to be used for so the advantage uh, you know especially of this is that you know we, we establish reserves which really are meant for like working capital purposes and rate stabilization council would pass bylaws to say you know this is what they should be used for and here's minimum and maximum ranges potentially so that you know we can then report on that on an annual basis and then the reserve funds, um, you know, they, they're really where, where council has purview for saving money long term for assets. So we would start bringing forward bylaws that will uh, develop certain um, reserves for asset categories. So then we can benchmark those reserve amounts against the asset management plan that we're going to be passing later on this year to say, you know, do we have 5%, 10%, 50% of our future needs sitting in reserves based on these different asset categories. Thank you very kindly. Any other questions? Seeing none, I call the motion. All in favor? Carries. Uh, 7.2.3 Darcy is again you debt management policy amendments. Uh, yes, so um, again another uh, report uh, that I brought forward uh, in, in uh, policy from uh, prior municipality uh, I think this is uh, extremely important uh, for North Huron to have uh, more comprehensive debt management policy, um, specifically since you guys are on the cusp of a lot of uh, growth related projects and infrastructure renewal that needs to happen. Uh, and the advantage of course of having a policy is that it provides um, clear understanding to the public as to what your intended use of debt is and it also provides clear direction to staff when we're developing preliminary budgets as to what you uh, kind of generally from the framework have agreed uh, debt to be used for and then we'll keep within those minimums or those maximum amounts of debt depending on uh, the different types so it's been broken out into to four different areas um, you know general tax supported infrastructure tax supported user rate and then development charge related debt uh, and um, you know this way we again uh, the advantage of this is that i can then provide a report on an annual basis uh, for each of the different areas and where we're at with the overall debt capacity so it becomes more transparent to the public thank you very much trevor yeah Reva, the one thing i would uh, the only comment that i would make um as it relates to the policy conversation is where it says you know it just says unless approved by council and i mean i think we got into the position where you know we make these policies we make policies period and then what council comes about and sees well maybe it's better that we we make an adjustment to that by by doing an exemption and what I would rather it see is that it not be an exemption based discussion rather if we think that it's something is coming about because it's important to change then we change the policy not make exemptions to an existing policy we get in I mean if you're going to continue to make exemptions to a policy why not make the policy change I mean and I think that's only my concern is is where we talk about unless um, unless approved by council I mean that would be the argument of, of council potentially making that that 
you know, even though it's potentially going above, like I use for example, the very one where it says do not exceed 75%, it says unless approved by council. Well, I mean, you know, council needs to understand those impacts before they do the approval. And I think ultimately, I would, as a counselor, I don't want to look at individual things as a snapshot in time because that decision I make could have drastic implications for the future. And if, if, if I made an adjustment to the policy that potentially would be more future looking, then there's a conversation to be had. I mean, we always got to be careful as council that we're not just making a decision based on a specific point in time because if we're making that decision in a point in time and changing the whole aspect of the policy then the real idea is why did we even have the policy to begin with I mean that's really my concern Reed so I mean I don't know if, if Darcy's had more you know more thoughts on that particular point I'm not suggesting an answer at this point because I mean we're not really getting um, you know we're, we're but that's my concern about the policy perspective where it says unless approved I mean council can amend any by a, by that exemption by a motion but I might it's really my question for for council is to say do we really want to do that rather than just get the exemption make the policy what we need it to be for future looking thoughts do you want to answer to that uh, Sri I appreciate the comment and I don't disagree like it can be removed um, I think that um, you know the deputy Reeve brings up a great point about making a decision now that may affect something way down the road. Um, the, the way I see this, you know, that unless approved by council, really would be if you're really close to that, or you're, you know you're going to go over that 75% threshold with the first one, let's say for example. But there is a recognition that there is debt that's coming off the books, maybe in just two or three years, because it's nearing the end of its repayment. And if that debt, as soon as that debt comes off the book, now you're well below the 75% threshold. Council could make, you know, uh, an approval to go above that 75% threshold, knowing that there's just a bit of short-term pain happening there. It's not a long-term thing. But I don't disagree that if if we we're making decisions that had significant long-term ramifications, then the reality is not to skirt around the policy. It's really to change the policy framework to meet the needs of the community. So just, just to follow up then from the Reeve here, um, my concern would be uh, as when, we, when I first became Reeve, there was, there was changes made to an agreement with a mutual, uh, with, well, with Morris Turnberry. But the agreement had failed. So going on what Trevor says, the way we've written this up, if something failed, if it wasn't brought to our attention, we wouldn't even, nobody knew it failed because it was never brought, nobody read it, nobody, there was no reason to. Nobody knew anything about it. So the way you've got this, with that, uh, are you suggesting then we would kind of have to know or somehow the council of the day would have to know written that way so it should be written another way where it's brought before the council? Just a, just a question on that. Maybe you could help me, Trevor. So yeah, in, I guess the answer to the clarity of from the Reeves perspective is with this, with this policy, there's going to be reporting annually that would indicate what the policy is providing. So what what I'm what what your concern is, Reeve, is now with this policy comes annual reporting to council would therefore then stop the whole position of so because you're not going to again at the end of the day as I see it and maybe Darcy can correct me, but I mean as an annual reporting, if these are the policies that say you're not going to have you know debt to the point of 75 percent. Well, he, the, the director of finance or director is going to tell us you are you're at 60 percent and you potentially could get to 75 if you do X, Y, and Z. So now you have a now you understand the framework as it relates to the policy, and the policy actually requires some annual annual um, reporting to council. Therefore, you're not going to have this oopsie daisy. I don't know where we're at, and the director of finance has actually some accountability to the rest of council that says here's what you have planned to me. The two I to I hold, and now I'm reporting on those holdings to make sure that we're in the mean of the same direction that council wanted at that time. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. So, any other questions, comments, or concerns? Well, so I guess for for clarity, so right now the director of finance motion to to approve the policy as presented. 
if you want to provide direction to him to remove those council exemption provisions, um, then you would want to amend that motion, I guess, just for clarity. And really, that was just for me. I mean, I, I, I understanding of where uh, the director of finance has said where he would expect more of those exemptions to take place, those are really discussions of council. I mean, those it's not really Darcy's uh, or the director of finance's position to tell us whether we should make an exemption or not. That's the council's direction of whether we should make the exemption. I'm just making for council's perspective is those are really not something that we I think we want to do. But in the case where uh, you know the director of finance has mentioned where we have these short-term kind of things, maybe that does make sense. And I and I agree. And I can and I completely didn't think of that kind of perspective in my head. So you know I'm fine with the motion as it reads. I think just from my perspective, it was just a comment for me to make sure I could talk through what what the real intent was of it. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Deputy Reeve. Uh, thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the floor, but I don't have a mover and lose. You don't have a motion on the floor, but basically Deputy so, Reeve. So I will I will make the recommended motion, Reeve. I will move that motion. We have a mover. Do I have a seconder? I need a seconds. Last chance for comments, concerns, questions. Seeing none, I call the uh, vote. All in favor? Carries. Thank you very much, Darcy. Okay, 7.4.1 is the transfer payment agreement with Wingham Fire Hall Washroom update, and Director Jamie McCarthy is going to speak to this. Any questions? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Falk. Falk. I don't know. Marty's not in. Don't in Council, is this in? Uh, yeah, my three reading. The only question was the uh, would there be a possibility of the uh, renovations because of code for COVID and the changing of the uh, uh, requirements for, for the fire services? Uh, would not a portion of that be able to be po uh, pushed over to all the other? Uh, uh, oh. Applicants of the uh, fire area board or the fire board. We don't have a fire board, but yeah. agreement. So the other um, um, 
municipalities in the agreement, they provide uh, funding for um, like uh, large fleet, fleet replacement capital and operational costs, but they do not um, provide any funds for um, building capital improvements. So those would solely be on the on our tax base. Uh, was there another question? No. Okay. Um, <coughs> I know what I was going to think of. I'm just wondering, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the CAO if, if uh, some of these improvements that we're doing could be covered under the um, uh, COVID uh, funding that we're getting. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Uh, to Rick Bailey, yeah. um, the COVID, um, do you mean the, um, like the, the 10000 or something dollars or twenty? A lot of the COVID um, relief funding went to security for the recreational facilities. So, no, there's not much or anything left okay. there. Yeah. I do know a county, uh, last week we did talk about the county having some reserves, so mm -hmm. if staff wouldn't mind just reaching out and seeing, and, I, and again, and you forgive me, I can't remember exactly what it was earmarked for, but if staff wouldn't mind just reaching out and see if, if uh, uh, we could get anything go ahead. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? <coughs> go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, I just, I just want to comment. I, I, I want to make it clear that this... If, if you were building a fire hall today, you would have had to have this. Like, I mean, you'd have to have separate yeah. fire, you have to have separate um, showering facilities. You'd have to have this stuff today. So to, in, to answer the question, I mean, that, that should be the bearer of us because ultimately we have the utilization of that. We built it, we are using it, regardless of whether we have partners or not. That is that is something that we have to have. Um, I mean, arguably, that is the concern that we should have to. We we built a brand new fire hall in Blythe, and I'm I'm I, I'm sure that that was all coming to part of it. So I mean, the stuff that we have, um, that we have existing stuff that we are replacing. I mean, we have to recognize that that there is some of those costs that we have to bear regardless of whether we have partners or not. And just to follow up on that one too, many of our partners have their own fire stations too, so they are servicing theirs too, for the most part. For the most part. Well, any other questions, comments, or concerns? Not seeing any, do I have a mover? Um, no, you don't. Can, can I get a mover? Uh, Kevin Faulkner moves, seconder. Paul Heffer seconds. All in favor? Carries, thank you. Jamie, you're up again. Thank you, Kelly. So as mentioned in the previous meeting, um, the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs, District 9, util utilizes two sections of North Huron's trails in the Blythe area. <coughs> the first section is the Blythe Greenway Trail, the second property recently acquired through a joint purchase agreement by the municipality of Central Huron and the Township of North Huron. Um, this property is commonly referred to as the Bell Lot and was acquired by the two municipalities to to secure groundwater rights for the inactive life public landfill site. Staff were provided direction by the Blythe Pullet Landfill Board to work with local snow snowmobile club to allow continued use of the trail that runs through the Bell Lot. Through many discussions with the OFSC, uh, District 9 Head Office, it was determined that the insurance provisions in the 2016 agreement required updating. Um, to incorporate the changes, staff recommend that bylaw number 92-2016 be repealed and replaced with a new bylaw. Oh, yeah, a new bylaw agreement. I'm not going to set that correctly, I'm sorry. Um, subject to council's approval, the new agreement, bylaw 109-2021, would incorporate new insurance clauses. The agreement would also include a time frame requiring staff to review the agreement and incorporate any updates that may be needed in the future. That time frame is two years. As mentioned, the two agreements allow use of the said portion of the Greenway Trail and the Bell Lot for the purposes of allowing valid, insured, permitted, and licensed snowmobiles and their riders to engage in snowmobile activities along the trail near and in life. The right to use the trail includes the right and obligation of District 9 to enter, establish, room, maintain, and post all required signage. Any questions? 
Paul, go ahead. Yes, through you, Reeve. I was just wondering, uh, on the, in the 74.2 part, um, the insurance is no trouble with that in, in North um, Central here and go with that. But I'm just wondering about that G to G trail, that bridge that goes up over top where it comes up north to Wingham. Uh, we're not going to be responsible for keeping that in line, in, in shape, are we? Or am I hitting the wrong thing here? Um, there, that trail that heads north out of uh, Blythe mm -hmm. on the G, it goes above the G to G trail. Are we going to be responsible? That came up about two or three years ago and before your time here. And I just wondered, did anything ever get, um, did we come to an agreement that the, um, uh, the snowmobile club would be responsible for that bridge if it needs to be upgraded at all? Uh, Dory Bailey to Councilor Hafford. I'm not um, totally sure which bridge because there's a couple of them in light. So there's a large culvert that is owned by Infrastructure Ontario and I can't remember if that's something that the snowmobile club crossed over. But there's also that larger bridge that was like that the public works department did fix up that goes over top of where the train was. So, yeah. if, I don't know, is it that's, that's the one yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we talked about it. So it's all fixed up. We don't have to worry about dollars going into that because of the snowmobile trail then, I take it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I just want to make sure of that. Uh, there <laughs> there's other issues with that. Yeah. So we're fine, Paul? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Um, any other questions, concerns? I don't believe I have movers on this one yet. So could I get a mover? I have Kevin moving. I have Rick seconding. Last chance for questions or concerns. Not seeing any, I call the motion all in favor. Carries. Go ahead, Jamie. All right. Um, speaking of the last question, um, so um, in June 2020, the Township of North Huron entered an agreement with the, with the County of Huron, the Town of Goderich, and the Municipality of Huron East to submit an application for the Zero Commission Vehicle Infrastructure Program by National Insurers Canada. The application was submitted and funding was received. The funding allows installation of 26 Level 2 electric vehicle charging ports throughout Huron County. Four of the 26 electric vehicle stations were allocated to North Huron. In July 2021, the County of Huron was notified that Carter Crew had partnered with Spark, Spark Park. <laughs> Spark Park was to provide 50% of the required financial investment for this project. While finalizing the agreements for signing by the county and local municipalities, a conflict of interest was identified between Spark Park and Arcan. As a result, Spark Park can no longer proceed as the investor in this partnership. Staff are seeking direction as to how the council wishes to proceed. If council, wish, if council wishes to proceed with this project, a total of $21,000 would need to be incorporated into the draft 2022 North Huron budget. Because this is a completely new initiative, it is very difficult to estimate possible revenue as part of the 2022 draft budget. Um, there has been some um, standard charge rates provided by the county, and at 0.04 to 0.05 cents a minute, Huron County staff have had preliminary con uh, conversation with charge crew, and. Um, Approximately 90% of the profit of those cents per minute goes to the municipality, but 40% of the revenue is used to cover electricity costs and the remaining 60 is used to pay back the initial investment and cover future maintenance costs. So based on these calculations, the, the County of Huron has projected a projected rate at which electric vehicle usage will increase in coming years, and the estimated payback is seven to 10 years for the township's contribution. Um, there is also an annual network fee of approximately $150 per unit per annum. These annual network fees would no longer be covered by the agreement, and council will have to include these maintenance costs in the annual operating budget. 
So I'm just going to follow up a bit with that then because this came before county and God forgives me if I get this wrong. They lost funding and it was my understanding that a, I can't remember whether it was a 60 or $100,000 they would lose for funding which means that the county and the three municipalities that were involved would have to pay that funding. So I haven't heard in anything the county's just told Jamie or Jamie's just told us the explanation of who pays for repairs, who pays for service. There's so many things that fell along the wayside that somebody else because of the, the, the funding loss has to pay for, which boils down to uh, we will end up paying for repairs and servicing, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing is I do believe the county sent it back to the staff to be real evaluated and have a conversation and bring it back before county. I would prefer that we wait till we hear something from county of what's going on before we get into this. Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong. Don't be afraid to, please. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Yep. So um, you will be receiving a report back to county council, but it would be in reference to all the lower tier municipalities and what decisions they move forward from their council. So yes, there was that 50% of the funding was is no longer able to be um, acquired by Spark Park. Um, so it would be coming from the municipality of uh, Huron East, North Huron, as well as Goderich, if they still wanted to, to still be part of this um, char electric charging stations for their respective municipalities. So that's what County Council will, will be receiving back. It's um, the responses from each respective municipality saying yes or no, they would want to still be in it and will be providing that 50% funding. Yeah. So very clearly that's, that's, that's a, going to be a cost to us and we're not sure of the costing or anything else. I think that, I think I'm a little disappointed that this company didn't stay with what the county wanted first unless I'm missing something. Please, any one of my staff members, let me know if I'm missing something here. I believe it should have went through the county first, then I could have brought it back to our, all of us could have brought it back to our representative, our councils, the three of us could have and had a discussion, and it hasn't gone that far at county. To me, this is reverse. The company that owns this is getting the three of us to say yes, then they're gonna to go to the county and say, well, they said yes. Does that mean the county's gonna supply money towards this or not? That's not a guarantee. Just help me if I've got this backwards, but my understanding is we've lost a lot of funding and it's gonna to fall to us to pay for the upkeep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, through, uh, yep. Through um, so the, the, the ARCAN contribution is still $130,000. Um, each municipality that would be the rest of the $130,000, we make up 21,000 of it. So we would be um, we would be 50% contributors instead of Spark Park. So that's kind of how that um, um, servicing agreement almost would be with the county. Um, I don't know. I don't believe. I haven't been told by the county that the county would be contributing any funds towards this. It is just um, um, our can and our can and then. Lower chair municipality. Thank you much, very much. And just before I send it out to the council again, my concern is, my understanding is, we would also be responsible for the upkeep and maintenance. And we know it's twenty-five hundred dollars a year for the one across the street that never works. Having said that, I believe Anita, you had your hand up. Yes, I have a question you know, to you, Reeve Bailey, uh, to Jamie. Again, uh, in your report under discussion, you say level two chargers were recommended for this type of application because they provide a top-up energy supply and can add 30 to 40 kilometers of mileage from an average 4 to 10 hour charging session. Does that mean that you can you put your vehicle there for 4 to 10 hours and you can only drive 30 to 40 kilometers or how is that working? Because then it sounds like me that it's a very expensive and not very useful service that they're putting in. Um, through Reed Bailey to um, Council Van Harrison, um, it would take a long time depending on the type of vehicle and um, degrees that you might be able to provide more insight on that. <laughs> I'm not fully, I know that there are different levels of chargers, one from just being a plug in the wall to, you know, I believe they go up to level four. Um, this would be somewhere right in the middle. Um, so I'm not fully um, 
like if if it's only 30 and 40 kilometers of but it's top up energy supply you wouldn't be completely on empty when you go and you park there and you charge but um if um sorry for leaning on you deputy reef site but no <laughs> just, just before i throw it over you, trevor just one other thing i want to point out from what i've just heard then so in the discussion at county there were three different levels one was forever to one was really quick and we picked the one in the middle for pricing it sounds like to me now that one in the middle just disappeared and we're going to the lowest longest uh and i'm going to hand that that's the way i read what was just said we're not even getting the same equipment that was originally offered trevor help me out with that please well uh, well i think we're going to get the same equipment that we asked for the, the uh, you know councilor van henderson's question is it depends on the type of vehicle i mean if you have a vehicle like mine which is a which is a hybrid vehicle which has electric and gas when you plug your vehicle into that charger um, as I use the one out here for example I can get a full charge in two hours yes it will only take me 30 to 40 kilometers that's as far as it'll go on 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 electric battery charge okay. but there are vehicles like a Tesla that are completely electric 100 percent electric you, you don't have that charging station you're not going to the gas station you're not going anywhere so i mean it depends on the type of vehicle that you have for what advantage it is for your municipality i mean so what would a tesla would it take 10 hours for the full no charge? i mean some for the most part i would say i would say for the most part a two two to four hours would probably get them a full charge i don't know for sure but i mean from a most part that's what i would suggest i mean the 10 hour charges it takes my vehicle when i plug into 120. so when i can plug my car into my my plug out my home it takes a full night to charge my car to 100 percent. so i mean that's the difference is these are higher charge capacities then you're one your standard 120 i mean it is it depends on what you're gonna get but i mean from a perspective and of my comment is is i think where you're looking at is we're going to get the same value it just depends on whether we're willing to pay and i mean my question is reeve and comments to jamie is now the question is if we're going to put this money into us the question is we asked we thought four would be good because we we could use them the question is maybe not maybe four isn't the answer like maybe four is not what we necessarily need in the municipality to service what potentially we need i mean maybe it's maybe it's one maybe it's two i i don't know and maybe we need to reconsider how many if council wants to continue if council doesn't and wants to wait for a county to talk i think then that's a conversation that we need to have so I'm going to go to Paul first. I'm going to have a comment, and then I'm going to bring it back to you, Jamie. Go ahead. Yes, through you, Reeve. I it got my my attention when it, it said there is um, there's conflict of interest here. Do you actually want to be dealing with a company that, that where this happened? I know Spark is out of it yet, but there's two of them there. Like somebody didn't do their homework too well. Uh, I I just don't feel comfortable in in uh, having support with a company that allow this to happen yeah my thought so I just want to add a comment in there I have no problem with our staff further investigating I have a problem with the motion as it reads where it says the further the council directs staff to negotiate an agreement I would prefer that to say ne negotiate and come back to council and I'm going to hand it over to Anita yeah I have problems with whole um, charging stations because in Europe they're already um, stations that are uh, in half an hour you can get a full charge in there you can have lunch there I feel like they're putting the old ones from Europe uh, putting them in here and that's not what we want yeah. so I okay. thank you Kevin well, thank you for your uh, Jimmy uh, do we have a, a high-level I guess a, a, a more, I'm not going to say an estimate, but it's really not an estimate, but are, with the different types of charging stations, do we have the infrastructure in the places that we want to put them for these stations, or are we going to have to upgrade our installation points that aren't covered under this, this $21? This is all just for, North, or for Huron County, in order for us to get one. But if we only got 
110 and, and 40, 60 amps over there, and we're going to put in 200 amp or 500 amp yeah. services uh, to where we want to put these. Uh, that's going to be a huge, more, well, not huge, I don't know the cost, but it's going to be an added expense uh, if we don't have the infrastructure. So did you have a high, just a high level yes or no whether we've got? Uh, through Reed Bailey to Council Faulkner, um, I do know that um, part of the um, $21,000 for the unit, so we would be contributing 10500 is for installation for the actual unit um, but if the installation is based at um, already having the infrastructure there to connect to i'm not sure so i can't say that for sure it wouldn't cost more than what's been quoted in this report okay. does that help yeah that's just that's just with you so I wonder if I could just throw it to council and if I could get a motion for this that the council of the township of North here and hereby receives the report from the director of public works and facilities dated December 20th, 21 regarding funding for the zero emission uh, vehicle infrastructure program. Sorry. Yes. Uh, just receives the report for the infrastructure program update for information and that further information is sought. Could I get a mover for that? So we're not saying, we're saying we need more information, period. Go ahead, uh, Jamie. Um, uh, Henry Bailey, for staff's understanding and direction, what specific information did you want me to obtain? Is it um, costing on installation and electrical um, compatibility? as well as um, what the, the um, overall revenue would be, um, how they calculated that out, that, that type of information, or? If we had these people before us yet to do a presentation, I think. So, no. so they're, the lead, so I, the I, I can't remember exactly, but I believe there was a representative from the county who came and spoke yes. to us uh, on behalf of Charger Crew. So my recommendation would be that they would come and make a presentation to us and the very questions that are being asked of you that's not fair to you because I mean, this is not your line of work. Uh, they come and this is new for all of us um, and we're all interested in electric. We want to save the world. I just said that a few minutes ago. I would suggest that uh, this company come back. You've heard the conversation around the table. Be prepared to answer those questions right off the bat. Have that as part of their presentation if they're interested in dealing with us. I just... I. Is that okay with everyone? So I'm going to need a motion then. So if if, if I'm understanding correctly, basically <coughs> it would be that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby receives the report of the Director of Public Works and Facilities dated December 20th, 2021 regarding funding for the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Program update for information and further that Council directs staff um, to invite Charger Crew and County of Huron representatives as a delegation. Um, <coughs> to provide additional information to council. Yeah, let's get some more information on this. It's worth pursuing. Do I have a mover? Mm -hmm. Kevin moves. Do I have a seconder? Rick seconds. Any last questions, comments, or concerns? Go ahead, Trevor. I just have a comment. Um, my comment is really, I mean, my comment is is that the county asked us for, the, really the county asked us if we were willing to support an arrangement for charging stations in the county. That's, that's the intent. Really, what I'm hearing from council is we're not we're not will and and I'm not suggesting that I'm not in disagreement. So let me just be clear that we're not willing to continue to put in charging stations at our cost because at the at the original request that this was going to be at a very zero cost to us mm -hmm. ultimately. So I mean that's what I'm hearing, and I mean ultimately I don't disagree with Councillor Heifer's comment. I mean, you know, how do you go how do you go this far down the road? and not know that there's a conflict of interest there i mean there need to have been a lot more due diligence done in the past to know what this is and maybe that's the conversation that really needs to be because i mean we don't know what the conversations were at the county and that but i mean i would ag i would agree having them come and, and understand what or if they're going to be somehow a change to where this funding is going to be and not out of our pocket 
because I would suggest that if, if it's coming out of our pocket, we're not willing to support for, for basically four charging stations is what I'm hearing from council. But I mean, I will let the, the motion go and I, I, I would agree with the rest of the motion. Jamie wants to answer that and Kevin had a uh, question. And, and just before we go ahead though, that is exactly the questions we're asked at County. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, to uh, to Ruby Bailey, to um, Councilor Deputy Recite, um, from my understanding, the reason why the Township of North Huron, the Town of Garage, and Municipality of Huron East were taking it back to their, their local uh, councillors is because we would be the 50% contributor to that project. There are no other granting bodies. So it's do you want the chargers or do you not want the chargers? Yeah. And I don't, this was, this has been a year in the making and I don't even know if it's been before that, that the county's been trying to, you know, drum up some type of grant funding. And I'm sure that was probably one of the reasons why, although they found out in July, they didn't tell the lower tiers until September, October. So I'm sure they probably were trying to find different granting organizations for this project, um, I can't speak for them. That would be good. Uh, that would be a good question for the Spark. I mean, and I can and and here on county, but also there's I don't know how many charging stations already at Cowbell as well that got installed, and I don't know if it was within this year or was it previous to that. Oh, so um. I, I don't know how many are there out there now from when this pro project first started. Yeah, I think it's best we have somebody before us. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Thank you, Yeah, I was just going to make that that comparison. That uh, it's not our municipality, but it is a private private enterprise, uh, Cowbell. But there there are four stations there with uh, uh, provisions for four more. Uh, I don't know their usage. I don't know what what they whether it's complementary or whatever, but. Uh, I know I'd much rather sit at a brewery and charge my car for 10 hours than I would <laughs> sit beside the arena. For, <laughs> so, uh, so just to, for as far as blood goes, I, we, I mean, we do have uh, access to them, and I don't think that, like I said, I have no idea how they charge. There's no, I don't see any card machines there, and I rarely see a car at them, but that's going to change. Yep. In, in, but uh, uh, I, okay. I, I would rather see the information come from the supplier first. Yeah, okay. So we have the motion on the floor. It's been read to us. Uh, do I have a mover? So you yes. oh, already have a mover and a seconder. I just haven't captured it. So do you know? Do you recall who the mover and the seconder was? Who was the mover and seconder? I moved it. I seconded it. And Rick seconded it. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Carries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, 7.6.1, appointment of a bylaw enforcement property standards officer. CAO Dwayne Evans is going to speak to us. Sure. Thanks, Your Worship. So as Council is aware, earlier this fall, the Township's bylaw enforcement officer slash property standards officer tendered the, his resignation effective December 17th. And as Council is aware, the intentions are that the chief building official will assume the dues and responsibilities of the bylaw enforcement officer. Uh, but until such time as the position is filled, we've been actively seeking a viable bylaw enforcement services options. And we've been successful. Uh, Dan Pinto is a full-time provincial offenses officer with the Grand River Conservation Authority. He provides bylaw, bylaw enforcement officer services to the township of Huron Kinloss on a call for service basis. Uh, we have been in communications with Major Pinto and he has advised that his full-time employment arrangement enables him to provide on-call services to the township of Huron Kinloss and he's expressed an interest in a similar arrangement for North Huron. The agreed upon arrangement is that any urgent matters, in particular safety related matters, will be dealt with um, as soon as possible. Um, and non-urgent matters, so grass height, removal of rubbish, will be dealt with as his schedule allows. Um, and that's a similar arrangement as I understand that they have with hearing and loss. Uh, further to that, um, we did, as you're aware, our previous bylaw enforcement uh, arrangement was through a service contract. Uh, Mr. Pinto 
and through that service contract, um, the provider um, had the WSAB coverage. Uh, Mr. Pinto um, has investigated, and he's not able to secure that WSAB coverage. Uh, we followed up with Hearing Kinloss and have learned that uh, he is on payroll, and that's how WSAB is addressed. So what this report proposes is the creation of a casual by law enforcement property standards officer um, and that that position be added to our consolidated 2022 salary grid uh, and that Mr. Pinto uh, be appointed uh, as a by law enforcement property standards officer for the township in North Huron, uh, effective um, day of passage, which would be today. Do I have a mover? I have Anita moving. I have Rick seconding. Questions, comments, concerns? Go ahead, Trevor, and then Paul. Yes, thank you, Eve. Uh, Dwayne, can you, uh, um, would the pay grant, uh, the salary grid and the bay band be removed once it's incorporated into the property standards role? Or, like, I mean, it, this is a temporary measure. I mean, this, uh, this is the intent is that it's temporary. So once that is the case, those pay bans and stuff would be removed from the municipality. Is that correct? Yeah, through your worship. The intention is that the chief building official will be the bylaw enforcement officer. But further to that, when that individual takes vacation or, you know, is off, um, that this, the, the recommendation proposal is that this individual would stay with us on payroll and would continue to provide those relief services. Um, which is a similar arrangement actually here in Kinloss. They have a full-time bylaw enforcement officer and Mr. Pinto provides support uh, to that municipality when their, when their full-time bylaw enforcement officer um, takes vacation or, um, you know, due to workload requires additional assistance. And the arrangement that is proposed with Mr. Pinto, Mr. Pinto is that it will be an on-call service model. Um, the previous arrangement was that we guaranteed a minimum of four hours a week. Under this arrangement, he would only um, receive payment um, when service is rendered. That, and not, not, so just to clarify in terms of that, if he goes periods of time, so if we bring on bylaw, if we uh, uh, have a chief building official and, and bylaw enforcement officer, and that individual assumes the bylaw enforcement work, Mr. Pinto basically does not get paid. He does not, he's not with us. But when we call upon him to either help us with increased um, workload or um, our um, chief building official bylaw enforcement officer is going on vacation for two weeks, um, Mr. Pinto would then step in essentially uh, carry on that work. Just to follow up, then I'm I, I'm my uh, because it's on an on-call basis. Um, I'm assuming, you know, uh, approval of the time required to do a certain call or whatever is going to be somehow managed or monitored from from a perspective of about what the actual call was compared to what the time was given. So through your worship, in terms of um, we have a complaint-driven process, complaint-driven system. So from a town hall administration, we will be assigning him the work that he will be doing. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Not seeing any. I believe I have a mover and seconder. So I call the uh, motion. All in favor? And that carries. Correspondence are next. Uh, 8.1 is here in an area research uh, search and rescue use of the vacant municipal building for here in an area search and rescue. Um, do you want me to? Do, what's that? Do you want me to maybe just explain the draft motion there? Yes. Yeah. So as council will remember, uh, the director of public works presented a uh, report on the former Blythe Public Works property, which is the property that the Huron and Area Search and Rescue are uh, requesting. So at this time, staff are just recommending that this be request, this request be incorporated as part of that follow-up report that the Director of Public Works will be bringing forward in the new year so that any decision is not made independent of that report. That'd be great, because I do believe we have uh, folks that are reaching out and asking for requests to buy the unit too, or thinking about it any so do I have a mover 
I have Paul moving. I have Kevin seconding. Other questions, concerns, or comments? Seeing none, I call the, call the motion. All in favor? Okay. Carries. Uh, nine, council reports. Reeves activity report. Well, another year is going to come to an end. Um, it's been a, a, a long, hard fight. We've had a lot of accomplishments, though. Many, many good accomplishments. Um, we're going to move into the next year. It's our last year as a council. We're going to be still doing 100 miles an hour, although my request is not to leave a burden for the next council. Um, so we'll keep that in mind, and I've already been reminded by that by one of my councillors at a previous meeting. Um, I just want to say it's been a really good year. It's, it's been a good year. We've suffered through COVID. We've did uh, all the COVID uh, clinics. I want to thank everyone that helped at the COVID clinics. Uh, and we haven't let it get us down. We've still been moving forward at 100 miles an hour. Um, that's about all I have to say for today. Council member reports, verbal uh, written updates from members who sit on boards or committees. Go ahead, uh, Rick. Yeah, after you, Reeve, uh, in regards to our CHEP meeting, mm -hmm. uh, that farm safety program that I, I think I mentioned once before, we're looking at promoting that in the spring of 2022. And then with uh, events that happen in Clinton there was we're talking about different levels of crosswalks different styles so maybe there's a, a way to message or to inform the public on how these different crosswalks work for their safety and our MPO representative he, he's able to provide us with toolkits like e-toolkits like videos and stuff like that so we can inform the public and, and there was uh, a spark of interest in regards to our park recreation and culture master plan which came up at that meeting and there was uh, talk of an opportunity to get a, a transportation plan could be cr created out of that in regards to the walking biking travel yeah, and that's all I had to report on that meeting. Thank you very kindly. Anyone else have any reports they'd like to bring forward? Okay, not seeing any. Um, just uh, uh, comments uh, by members. Go ahead, Trevor. Yes, thank you, Reeve. Um, I have a couple of uh, two uh, comments to uh, to bring towards uh, to council's um, thoughts tonight. Um, one, um, Councillor Heffer and myself uh, were graciously um, present at uh, this past Saturday at the uh, Christmas dinner that was put on by Maureen and Gary Lyle and the William Columbus Center. Um, it, it was actually staggering the amount of uh, food that was provided in just over two hours. Um, through the with the food share support and and that type of stuff um, a year ago a year ago this December there was hundred and twenty five meals that were distributed by delivery only that's just delivery this year 200 over 225 meals were distributed between Brussels Lucknow Gory Roxeter um, and Wingham here so that's just delivery over 500 meals were presented and provided individual meals um, to people that are less fortunate that may may uh, took the meal and have of sheer gratitude and I and I I will not speak for Councillor Heifer I, I got to say it is the most inspirational day of my life every year um, to be able and I mean I can say wholeheartedly do I do I provide anything but traffic control absolutely not but to be able to say Merry Christmas and hope they're having a uh, they get out of that meal what solely they deserve in my mind is a heartwarming thing that I will never ever leave in all of my time in this community and I have said to Gary Lyle and Marine Lyle I don't care if I'm a counselor or not I will be there if you need me to be a part of that um, and I mean 
there is a numerous community members that have that I bet you there's over 50 that probably deal with with either distribution tr delivery cooking I mean Sue and her group spend an entire week cooking for that one day and I mean they wouldn't have it any other way and I mean there was a lot of people that give and volunteer and provide funding and provide food at no cost to them so I mean to be able to have that uh, community event in the and be able to provide that information to the community you know usually the, the 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 ratifying part about this is is normally there's about 125 meals that usually go back into the food bank that are redistributed in January this is the staggering number we they delivered 500 meals there was only three left by the end of the by the end of the two hours so that's the that's the the, the reality that we're in today about how things are in our community so I mean this is a heart well thank you to them um, and and from my heart I mean I I love it every every year I do it and, and I will always cherish the time that I get to say to put a, a smile on their face because you know it's it's nice to say uh, when they leave there they're honking their horn and they're happy um, and thankful that they've they that we were able to put a smile on their face so I mean that's that's my first comment Reeve um, my other comment is um, we had the Blythe parade uh, it was not this past obviously it was not this past weekend but the weekend before and this is a an absolute heartfelt thank you to our first responders our first responders were out tirelessly at a call on the Friday night on the Friday night they worked uh, from from conversations that I had with Councillor Faulkner um, and the rest of council on that Saturday they were out till the wee early morning hours of Saturday you would not have known they weren't or they, they were out they were at the parade the trucks were in good clean shape they I mean they put on a show like they had just woke up and wanted to be a part of a community event and I mean I think sometimes we take for granted what our first responders give up to do what we what they have to do in our community to be where we are their families may or may not see them for 12 15 hours a day or their employers or whatever else has to happen they give up a lot and their families give up a lot to provide support and to provide community events like a parade like a touch the truck those types of things that they've done and we take sometimes we take those things for granted and I'll tell you after I heard that comment um, I, I'm not going to be taking it for granted anymore in the sense that it's hard it's hard to to do those things when you're tired and you want to just stay at home and but we don't hear any complaints and I want to say thank you to the, from the bottom of my heart that they're willing to put those things as a priority and sometimes their their family life takes a, a burden and I want to say thank you to them and I want to say thank you to their families because I think it's important that we rec recognize what they do to the community what they do for us here here anyone else not seeing anyone thank you very kindly um, notice of motions 10.1 bylaw number 100-2021 North Huron flag uh, protocol policy do I have a mover I have Anita moving I have Kevin seconding all in favor carries Bylaw number 10.2, bylaw number 101, 2021, appointment of committee of adjustment for uh, 2022. Do I have a mover? Paul moves. Rick seconds. All in favor? Carries. Bylaw number 102-2021, adoption of 2022 salary grid. Do I have a mover? 
Paul moves, seconder. Rick seconds. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. It was a slow one, guys. <laughs> Bylaw number 103-2021 investment policy. Do I have a mover? Anita moves. Kevin seconds. All in favor? Carries. Uh, Bylaw number 104-2021 agreement with Maitland Valley Conservation Authority, Galbraith Park. Do I have a mover? Paul moves, Anita seconds, all in favor, carries. Uh, bylaw number 105, 2021, agreement with the Ontario Federation of Snowbuilders Club, Clubs, Wingham. Do I have a mover? Paul moves, seconder please. Rick Kevin seconds, thank you. All in favor, carries, thank you. Um, uh, number 107, 2021, appointment of bylaw enforcement. Reef Bailey. Yep. 106 is where you're at now and oh my dire goodness. director mccarthy that's the one she's going to provide an update on come on up jamie and this is bylaw uh number 106-2021 uh sign agreement with uh, wvrh holdings inc which is here in tractor blyeth and Darth, uh jamie's going to speak to this first Thank you, Bailey. You're um so a little bit different than what i originally reported on was a five-year agreement with here on tractor for the blight Welcome to Blythe side. Here on Tractor um, contacted the municipality and indicated that they only wanted a one year agreement. So we changed it to a one year agreement as they would like to expand in the future. So they didn't want to be held to it for five years. So you'll see before you a one year agreement with your on Tractor for the Welcome to Blythe sign on uh, 25 and 4. Thank you very kindly, Jamie. Do I have a mover? I have Kevin moving. I have Anita seconding. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Bylaw number 2107, uh, 2021, appointment of a bylaw enforcement property standards officer. Do I have a mover? Trevor moves. Seconder, please. Rick seconds. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. This must be the end of the year or something, folks. <laughs> Bylaw number 108 2021 agreement with uh, RSM for building services. Do I have a mover? I need a move. Seconder, please. I have Kevin seconding. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Bylaw number 109 2021 agreement with the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs, Blythe Greenway Trail. Do I have a mover? Rick moves. Seconder, please. Paul seconds. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Bylaw number 110 2021 agreement with J.R. Burnside and Associates for Drainage Superintendent Services. Do I have a mover? Anita moves. Rick seconds. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Uh, agreement uh, uh, bylaw number 111 uh, 2021 agreement with uh, PSD Citywide Inc. Do I have a mover? I have Trevor moving. Seconder, please. Seconder, please. Rick seconds. All in favor? Carries. Thank you. Announcements. The next regular council meeting will be held on Monday, January 17, 2022 at 6 p.m. at the North Huron Town Hall Theatre. The next budget meeting will be held on Thursday, January 13, 2022 at 9 a.m. at the North Huron Town Hall Theatre. The next North Huron Police Services Board meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 21, 2022, that should be. No, no, 2021 at 7 p.m. at the North Huron Town Hall Theatre. The next Economic Development and Recovery Committee meeting will be held on Thursday, January 20th, 2022 at 2 p.m. in the North Huron Town Hall Theatre. The next Wingham BIA board meeting will, will be held on Thursday, January 20th, at 2022 at 6.30 at the Hot Stone Lounge in the North Huron West Cass Community Complex. The next Blyeth BIA meeting will be held on held on Thursday, January 27th, 2022 at 8 a.m. at the Blyeth District community center and Reeve Bailey the one yes. thing I maybe I'll just note for because there is public watching um, so council does have any other business the potential return to electronic meetings so some of those locations may vary depending on where council lands on that so just for the benefit of the public watching do I have to say them all over no it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> 2021 Park Recreation, Cult Recreation Culture, Ma Culture Master Plan that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby directs staff to prepare a report outlining the short-term, medium-term, and long-term action items on the final Park Recreation and Culture Master Plan for Council's consideration at a future meeting. Do I have a mover? 
Paul moves, seconder please. Rick seconds, all in favor? Carries. Potential return to electronic meetings. At the December 17, 2021 Emergency Operations Control Group meeting, the control group recommended that the council provide direction as to whether to return to electronic meetings for all council boards and committee members. Uh, meetings is warranted in light of the increase of COVID-19 cases. So we did have this conversation. All hell's breaking loose around us again. Do we want to be behind or in front of the eight ball? Do I have a mover? So there is no Most, motion, Your Worship. No, Basically, sorry. at this time, it's at um, Council's uh, discretion Fresh of it. whether um, to return to in-person or to return to electronic meetings or not. Um, I will, um, for Council's benefit, uh, so there have been members of various committees who have requested of whether a return to uh, virtual meetings uh, could occur. So I guess just for Council's benefit, um, we have received some feedback, but ultimately the electronic meeting provisions in Council's procedure bylaw uh, say that it's at the discretion of Council which meetings will be held electronically. Okay, let's open it up. Thank you very much, Carson. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I've heard from the, uh, uh, at least the Bly BA, the, the committees that I've been on uh, are, are strongly uh, requesting that we, uh, for this uh, time being in the, with the COVID, uh, Cases going back up, uh, <clears throat> I would then put forward a motion to allow uh, any of our uh, committees of council, if they wish, to uh, go to in uh, video conferencing, uh, if they so deem. Okay. I'm just going to let Carson speak to that because I had a conversation with Carson. Uh, I forget when about this, and it was a bit of a not sure we could do it. That would just explain. Yeah, so basically council's procedure bylaw has to, it dictates uh, that the authorizing resolution basically has to specify which meetings can be uh, virtual um, as opposed to committee discretion. And I guess that's largely written that way for so that there's clarity to the public um, uh, which meetings will be held in what format. Um, so basically if, if council is desirous, my staff recommendation would be something along the lines of that the Council of the Township of North here and here dry, by directs for all Council Committee and Board meetings um, to be held electronically effective January 1st, 2021 or something along those lines. Does that need a time frame or a reference as to when we go back or could, because it's not under emergency? So, yeah, so basically... So nothing, nothing would bring us back unless we deem it so again. So would, do we have a time limit on that or, or, or a specification of uh, to when we go back? So, so the way... Uh, through your worship to answer Councillor Falconer's question. So the way the procedure bylaw is written is it's entirely at the discretion of council, right? So just like any motion you bring forward, um, we, we, you would do that at that time. So when council wants to see a return to in-person meetings, any councillor can bring that motion forward um, and then that determination can be made at that time. Brief Bailey. Is Sorry, this only ahead, for Dad. committee Sorry, meetings or also for our council meetings? Uh, the the motion that I would recommend would be that all council committee and board meetings um, to ensure that there's consistency across the board. I think the difficulty, just so everybody understands, is my understanding of when we switch back and forth, it's hard for the public to track which is a in and which is out. Therefore, you're going to run into public complaints because I was at the theater and you guys were on TV. And I'm really unhappy. And so I think that's a and, lot of. And it. if I may, Your Worship, so we don't necessarily look, know what provincial legislation is going to look like, even a couple days from now. Um, so theoretically, it could be imposed upon us that we can't be meeting in person. And uh, I, so I guess from the clerk's department as staff, we would like direction kind of one way or the other, um, because for the first meeting in January and February, there are. A significant number of public notices for planning applications for public meetings for drainage public meetings and then for the committee of adjustment as well um, so in an ideal world we're getting those notices out um, only one time saying yes it's going to be an electronic meeting or yes it's going to be in person uh, so I mean I guess um, knowing that the provincial government can change it like that uh, it might be prudent that we kind of move towards virtual meetings uh, at this time and kind of prepare for the worst that being said at any time council wants to 
make the move back to in person or in person meetings again, you have that uh, entire complete discretion. Did you want to have that in writing too? Is that what you're after? That we well, no, no, I'll rescind my motion. You're going to rescind it? My, my motion, yeah. Uh, Carson had has a uh, one written out that okay. that he was preferring uh, that was much more <laughs> in line than what my, my request was. Did you want to put that motion forward then? Somebody uh, like to put that motion forward? I would put that motion for that we go back into uh, virtual meetings. Do I have a seconder? Paul seconds. Let's open it up for conversation. And that was quite a lull there. Do you want me just to read back that yes, motion? Yes, please. So the motion on the floor then would be that the Council of the Township of North Huron hereby directs for all Council, Committee, and Board meetings to be held electronically effective January 1st, 2022. Trevor. Yes, thank you, Reeve. Um, I'll make my comments the same as I made at the, the emergency control group. Um, I, I recognize that case counts are going the wrong way. I recognize that. But I also recognize the fact that the communication that has been given by our province and our federal government is get a vaccine, we'll be out of this soon. That's been the communication. And where are we at? Ontario is 90% vaccinated and we're going the opposite way to lockdowns, potentially enclosures and all those types of things. I recognize that we have to we, ha we have to protect public health. I, I recognize that. And I also recognize the fact that we have to protect our employees in the sense of why we've done certain things to town hall here. We spent a pile of money to segregate people from our staff. <laughs> we did. What I don't recognize is the fact that, especially at a council meeting, and especially at, I'll talk about the BIA's meetings or the police service board because I sit on all, I mean, you can throw a hand grenade and not hit anybody. Like we, I mean, literally, we could spend, I could sit here and somebody can sit way over there and we're fine. Like there's not enough people. And unless there's a, a, an issue like, like we had tonight where the significant community involvement like public guidelines are going to allow us to do what we need to do in person and for the most part as I said we as a we as a community are going to have to figure out how to live with COVID like it's not going away anytime soon so you know, I, I recognize that we have, and that's one of the reasons why I've been very cognizant of, of vaccine mandates and all that stuff about not having them. Because, I mean, I don't want to disengage people from not being able to participate. And, I mean, I recognize the fact that when we have these electronic meetings, we may not be getting people that be able to participate because they don't understand the electronics part of it. And that's the concern I have, is are we being any more transparent by being allowing them to come here and doing it live stream this way, or we're doing electronic? Like for example, a normal council meeting, we're, we've been all standing here together for the, for the better part of two years. Is it gonna change? No, I mean, I, I would, honestly, I would protect, I, I would tr trust you, all of the people in this room with my life. If we can't do that now, we're in real trouble. So I'm not, I'm not a proponent to, to, to going backward. I'm proponent of dealing with what the public health is providing us. If Ontario wants to choose as public health, 
and the Ontario government want to shut us down, then the people of North Huron can be pissed and whine and moan and complain to the province of Ontario, not to the township of North Huron because we've done something that they're now feeling that we're not being transparent and open with them. We followed Ontario guidelines from the get-go. Why would we change now? And that's where my position or my comments come from, Reeve. Wait, thank you very kindly. Anyone else? Seeing no more, we have a mover and seconder. There is a motion on the floor. All in favor, raise your hand. I feel lonely up here again. <laughs> okay, it's defeated. We will move on. Closed sessions and reporting out. The Council of Township and North here and hereby re, uh, proceeds at 905 to an in-camera session closed to the public to discuss the following. A proposed or pending acquisition or disposi disposition of land by a municipality or local board. Offer the purchase of a municipality owned property and further that the CEO Evans and Clerk Lamb remain in attendance. And so Reeve Bailey, if I can just slightly amend that um, motion. Um, so Matthew is also in attendance so I'd look um, to add uh, Matthew uh, Santa Capita um, to remain in attendance for that as well so infer basically I would read in further that CAO Evans Clerk Lamb and Matthew uh, Santa Capita remain in attendance thank you very kindly do I have a mover Paul moves Anita seconds all in favor carries let's take a five-minute break <laughs> <laughs> 